thank you very much for your kind introduction. So, um, yeah, today I want to talk about the representative theory and the optimizing theory of neural networks. Okay. So, yeah, my group is working on the deep learning theories. Okay. So, you have seen some many huge success of the deep learning in many applications, like uh, large language models and their general, uh, well, well, the diffusion models. And so basically, we, we want to know why the deep learning works so well in many practice. And uh, we want to clarify so what is going on inside the deep learning. And we want to characterize what is the, the good, um, what is the essence of the good learning system. So that is our, our uh, purpose of the, 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 the team. And so, yeah, so we are doing, we're tackling that problem from many aspects. So yeah, today, so I want to talk about these two topics. So the one is a representative theory and the other one is optimizations. In the first half, I will talk about, about the minimax optimality of the model. And in the latter half, I will talk the mean field range one time. Okay, so let's move on to the first part. So first, uh, I will show the some minimax optimality of the diffusion model. So this is a joint work with uh, Oko Kazusato and uh, Shunta Akiyama. So these, they are uh, the students of my group. And so actually, so the main contributor is uh, Kazusato. He did a very great job for this work. And actually, so there is a poster about this work. So if you are interested, so we can discuss in more details in a coffee break. So yeah, let's have a discussion. Okay, so the diffusion model. So I think you are very familiar with the diffusion model. So you have seen many examples from these models. Example in the DALI 2. So if you input this text to the DALI 2, then it generates the, this kind of image. So it is very natural. So even though this image does not exist in uh, nature, so but uh, we, it makes sense. So we can understand this figure will explain the input text. So it is amazing. So everybody is surprised about by this. Uh, this kind of results. And the following year, the DALI 2, there are many um, related models like uh, stable diffusion and the mid journey and so on. Yeah. So, what we want to do is to give some more mathematical justification of these models. And we want to find some mathematical structure behind the success of this kind of, uh, well, the models. Okay, so the diffusion model consists of two parts. One is a forward process and the reverse process. So the usually diffusion process is used to generate the data from conditional distribution, like in DALI 2. So yeah, we input the text and we, it generates an image conditioned by this text. So, so that is our usual usage, but in this research, so just for the simple analysis, so we consider just a generating of one distribution. It's not a conditional distribution. We, we try to generate the data from one targeted distribution. Okay. So yeah, what the diffusion model is do is that we, in a forward model, it changes, we gradually modify the, 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 the target distribution, which, which should be very complicated, to very simple distributions, like a Gaussian distribution. Okay? That can be done by running, for example, the OU process, so by running this kind of um, stochastic differential rotation, then the data becomes something like a, a Gaussian noise. So yeah, so after some uh, no, sufficient number of data, uh, sufficient, sufficient length of the time, so then the data distribution becomes like a Gaussian distribution. So this is very easy to handle. So we can obtain the, the samples from this Gaussian distribution, so it's very easy to generate a sample. Okay. In the reverse process, um, we start from this one, so because it's easy to, to generate the data from Gaussian distribution. Then we trace back this time. Then finally, by changing the distribution a little bit, so then um, finally uh, we arrive at the original distribution. Then we get the sample from uh, the target distribution. So that is what, what the diffusion model is doing. Okay. So I want to explain a little more details about the model. The forward process is basically given by this OU process, the uh, Unstein Udenbeck process. So this is not a, the, the, this one choice. There are many other variants of the choice, but this is a simplest settings. So yeah, the good point of this OU process is that uh, we have an explicit form of the marginal distribution. So let PT be the distribution of XP, so this is marginal distribution. Then we have, we, we can show the PT is given by a kind of a convolution of Gaussian distribution and the, 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 the initial distribution P0. So this is what we want to generate from. But anyway, the so PT is given by uh, this formation. And, and moreover, so 
there's an extreme form of the mean and variance of this Gaussian distribution right there. Here. Uh, it, it's very easy to compute. And here is more besides a uh, um, distribution, the distribution or the marginal distribution. Suppose that we start from y, so y is the initial point like this. We start from y, then there at time t the distribution can be distributed by t. So yeah, so this is our um, uh, that the, so this formulation states that the conditional distribution of x t conditioned by the initial point y is given by this exit form of the Gaussian distribution. So this is a very important to implement the, the diffusion model. Okay. So another important point is that the distribution PT was to the normal distribution in exponential order. The k divergence between PT and the Gaussian distribution was zero in exponential order. So this is also another important uh, property. Okay. And so the, uh, the reverse process, we consider this uh, kind of a um, stochastic differential equation. So as I said, so so in the forward process, and it is so we take a kind of a t bar time, so t bar length time. So if we stop the forward process at t bar, it could be a statistically large. Then so the distribution pt bar is all, all, already very close to the Gaussian distribution. So we trace back the dynamics to the t zero. So we start from here to here. And we we want to we want to arrive at the distribution by using a reverse process. Okay. So now, so, so in the reverse process, so we start from the this we, we start from t bar. So um, the, this, this distribution of the, the initial distribution of the reverse process is given by p t bar. We start from here, then we run this on uh, the stochastic differential equations. Then so we can show that from some theory, like, like from like these papers, the the distribution y t is the same as p t bar minus t. So, so because the time is reverse, the relation is always reverse. So that means that y t that distribution of y t bar is p zero. So the p zero is what we want to generate the, the, the sample from. So yeah. So just running so the density bus process, we can obtain a sample from the target distribution. So but there are there are some unknown quantities like a p t bar. So this contains the information for the target distribution, and also inside this stochastic differential equation, there is a small function. Of the true distribution, so the, the true distribution of PT, and so the PT also contains the information of the target distribution. So we need to estimate these kind of things. But so we know that PT bar is very close to the Gaussian distribution because it is it exponentially combines to this distribution. So you can replace this by a Gaussian distribution, and so. So now we suppose that this score function is estimated in some sense, then so we have an estimated S plus, so then we may replace this by the estimated score function. So in practice, we run this uh, approximated process, then we would then have a kind of a simulated data of the target distribution. Okay. So then the next question is how to estimate S plus. Okay. So here's one uh, important relation. So now, so we neglect the, the, the initial distribution approximation, so we we consider the y hat of zero is exactly distributed from the, the true distribution like this. So then the k divergence between the target distribution p zero and our generated distribution. So uh, 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 that, that the distribution of our generated data is bounded by this quantity. So this is our kind of mean square error between the, the true square function and estimated square function. Okay. So here is a like a square, yeah, the integral of the square with that. Uh, the, the distance between the, the, the two squad and the estimated squad. So the basic um, idea in the diffusion model is to minimize this uh, um, the, the, the mean square of errors. Okay. okay, so yeah, so as I said, what we want to do is to minimize the, this objective with the to some SR. Okay. But uh, okay, so we, we change the some notation so so why so, so the distribution of yt is same as xt bar minus t, so you can replace yt by xt like this. And this, but, but, but this uh, score function contains that true function. Yeah, so we need to approximate this in, in, in some sense. That, that can be done by like this, okay? Uh, but through some simple calculations, by expanding this square functions, you can easily check that this equation is the same as this equation. So, yeah, you, yeah, I mean, Instead of the marginal distribution of PT, so you can use the conditional distribution of PT. Okay, 
So you, you see that it's, the, it's just xt, but this is a constant distribution of xt, even some initial quantity is zero. So as we have seen, the condition distribution xt is uh, explicitly given. So that, that was Gaussian distribution. Okay, so please, please go back. Okay, so this this Gaussian distribution. So we have the explicit form of the mean and variance of the condition distribution. So we can easily calculate the score function of that condition distribution. Okay, so this can be calculated, this can be computed as explicitly. And but but instead of that, so there appears a new expectation with respect to the initial point x zero. So we need to calculate this expectation. But so suppose that we have n data points. This is a freeing data from the target distribution p zero. Then maybe so you can replace this expectation by an average of a training data. Okay. So given the initial point x zero or like x zero is like a training data point x i. So then the conditional distribution of xt is just a Gaussian. So yeah, we, we can simulate this expectation. Maybe so running this all your process maybe times, then you can approximate this expectation so, with any precision. Okay, so so this loss function can be computed by ourselves. So yeah, this is called the empirical score matching loss. So we just minimize this loss function with uh, with less to the some model x. So yeah, in, in practice, we use a uh, deep neural network as a model of the slow function S. Okay, so in, in, in my image data set, mm -hmm. image generation programs, we usually use a unit as a model of S. But in, in, this, in this study, we just consider it really connected deep neural network. The, the d-dimensional input and the dimension, dimensional output, the such a fluidly connected unit, is used for the, the model of S. Okay. So yeah, then this is our, the diffusion model. So, um, then the, our interest is the theoretical analysis of this model. So how accurate we can estimate the distribution. So that is our question. There are many LR analysis like this. But uh, so what we want to do is to do more quantitative, uh, quantitative analysis of errors. So how fast the, the, the error will converge. So that, that kind of thing is our question. So for that purpose, we do a, a, a kind of non-parameter non -parameter density estimation approach. Okay, so for that purpose, so um, we we assume some these, some conditions like this. So, yeah, so maybe these assumptions are a little bit strong, but but this is very a kind of a well, well, usual way in the non-parametric analysis. Okay, the, the first we assume that the two distribution P zero has a support on the unit cube in the d-dimensional space, the minus one one to the d, and but yeah, so this is not so essential. We can relax these conditions. But the next, 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 the, the next condition is more essential. So we assume that P0 is included in so called the vessel space, okay? so, which is written by like this. So, what is the vessel space? But I, I, I don't have, have much time to explain the, 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 the precise definition of the vessel space. So roughly speaking, the vessel space has a um, parameter with a smoothness S. Okay, if P0 is included in this vessel space, we can say the P0 is S times differential. And the S times derivative is S order derivative. That, so sorry, the LP node of S, S times differentiation is bounded like this. So this means that if S is large, the P0 is uh, many times differentiable, and so the P0 is very smooth. If S is small, we cannot differentiate the P0 so many times, so the P0 is not smooth. Okay, so the depending on the smoothness of the piezo, we the, 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 the parameter S changes. Okay, so the, we also assume some additional uh, for technical function like this, but this is just uh, for, for, for a theoretical uh, uh, proof. So we actually we show the components under this assumption. Okay, so then uh, this is a result. Okay, um, so here's a so we we bound the TV distance, the total variation distance between the true distribution and the distribution of our of, 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 of generated data. Okay, so we generate the data, so that is denoted by y hat, and we consider distribution of the generated data and the true distribution. So that distance between them can be bounded by this quantity. So n to minus s over two s plus t. So you can see that the rate of convergence is characterized by the smoothness. So as the smoothness increases, the rate of convergence becomes faster. So yeah, if the target distribution is very smooth, it is easy to estimate. But if, if it's not, if it is not, so the, 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 the estimation problem becomes bigger, then the rate of convergence becomes slower. Okay. And, but uh, so there is some large constant, uh, large point load all that. So but, uh, this is a 
kind of edge factor of the proof. So, so we, did, we strongly believe that the log to the 9 of n, this time could be much, much more degrees. But anyway, so we have this rate of normal. And so it is well known that this is a minimum optimal rate. So in other words, so we cannot improve this rate of convergence by any other method. So there is no method that can be faster than this rate of convergence. Uh, okay, so I should, I should say that n is a sample size. Okay? So as sample size goes to infinity, then the, the, this estimation of error will, will go to zero. So the rate, the, that rate is depicted here. Yeah, so, so yeah, so this rate of convergence cannot be improved. So, so this is a kind of surprising. So because the diffusion model is doing not only the this density estimation or distribution estimation, but also it realizes uh, efficient sampling. Right? It, 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 so it, it do it does both of them. So, but although there is some additional tasks, the sampling procedure. So, but it, it preserves the, the estimation uh, no, 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 no. So, yeah, just the estimating the density itself is not so difficult problem. Yeah, just maybe so you can just you can use uh, like a kernel density estimation or something like that. But we needed to do uh, we need to realize uh, the efficient sampling by estimating a score function. So that that gives us some additional complexity of this problem, but it it still realizes the amount of things. So that is a good point. And more, and more, more deep, so indeed, uh, we are estimating a score function which takes an input x and t. So not only the x, but it also takes a t as an input. So that means that s hat is the input of d plus one dimensional t. In the usual um, non parametric regression problems, the rate of convergence is, is affected by the input dimensional t. So here, that, that is a t plus one. So maybe, so in that case, in that sense, maybe so d could be replaced by d plus one, but it, it gives a slower rate. But uh, we, we don't have, we don't have. So yeah, this is a very nice thing. So the one reason here is that uh, the PT is diffuse. So I mean, so the PT is given by the convolution between the true distribution and the Gaussian distribution. Because because such a convolution, so PT, so PT is a, like a kind of diffuse thing. Diffuse, diffuse quantity of the P0, so then so the P, PT is very smooth. So actually, so for any positive T, the, the, the margin of distribution PT is infinitely many differential. So PT is very smooth. By taking it into such a smoothness into account, then we can show the optimal uh, rate. Yeah, that is a very important point. So okay, so next we can we consider some low dimensional structure of the data. So suppose that the, the support of the distribution is in uh, some low dimensional subspace, like with the dimensionality d prime. The d prime could be much smaller than the whole space d. So what happens? Okay, so in this case we cannot define the total variation distance because the distribution is degenerated. So the TV distance is not very defined. So instead of the TV distance, we consider the state distance. Yeah. So yeah, we can also show the, the optimal rate in, in terms of the Wasserstein mm -hmm. distance. Okay, but if you consider Wasserstein distance, the optimal rate is faster. So you you see, if, if, sorry, this is very small. So there is an additional plus one term here because 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 the appears a plus one. So this is faster than the that for the TV distance. But anyway, so this is a minimum optimal rate. Yeah, so so we so to obtain this faster rate, so we need to modify the, the proof a little bit. It is a very difficult point, but anyway, so we can show this one. Okay, another interesting point is that so here is a D prime. So in, in the last slide there appeared D like this. So instead of D, D prime is appearing. So now D prime is smaller than D. So this means that the so diffusion model can identify the, the the structure of the support. So then, so it can adapt to the intrinsic dimensionality of the data. So, so that means that so it can avoid the cardinal dimensionality. So, so, so this result partially supports you. And actually, the so actually gave a very nice uh, contribution through their studies of the, 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 this research. So yeah, he initiated the uh, uh, a kind of a, uh, the, the this research study. Okay. Um, so in the second part, what we want to do is to optimize this object function. So let us consider the convex function of the distribution. We want to optimize the distribution. We want, for example, we want to fit some distribution to the data. Then there is some loss function that is a convex. The distribution view. Yeah, we just want to minimize this object function. So, but uh, this object could would not be the 
um, the strongly convex. So we add some strong, com strongly convex objective as a ring by ring. Okay. So it, basically, this lambda two is small. We need to be regular yeah. between them. So what we want to do is to optimize this regularized object objective. So then to optimize this objective, so what we want to, what we do is just a grand descent. We do a grand descent in a major space. Okay. So this is very almost the same as uh, finite individual settings. But, but in a middle space, we use the so-called master sign granite flow. This is a kind of granite design in the middle space. So that is given by just partial differential equations. So you don't need to uh, uh, see some details. But uh, OK, so that is uh, so some um, notation. So delta mu divided delta mu. So this is a kind of a functional derivative. So this is a kind of uh, internal dimensional derivative. But, but you can consider this is just a derivative by a distribution field. OK, so yeah. And this is a process of granite flow that, yeah, so that is given by this partial differential equations. Okay, so now, so if you, if mu t follows this equation, then mu t will converge to the global optimal solutions because the object is complex. Okay, and so now, uh, so we, we, we represent the solution mu t by an infinite many particles. We consider a kind of particle representation so that distribution is represented by many, many particles. There are many particles and a the distribution of a particle corresponds to mu t. So then, if mu t combines to the global optimal, so the, the true distribution, uh, no, part, the global optimal distribution, then the particle also should move. Okay, so the distribution is moving, so then the, the particle consisting of the distribution should move. That dynamics is given by this so called Hopper Frank equation. So this is a stochastic differential equation. Okay, so, so this time corresponds to this time, and this time, so this is the prime emotional time. This is coming from the, the, the HUP time, and anyway, so we have this is stochastic uh, equation. So, yeah. so, yeah, roughly speaking, this is a like, gradient of the, this time. Okay? This is a kind of, so, yeah, each particle of the distribution tries to minimize the objective function. Okay. So, yeah, well, we are interested in the components of this dynamics. So, but there are many uh, applications of uh, uh, this dynamics. So, one is uh, optimizing the mean field neural network. The mean field neural network is defined by like this. Okay, so here HXZ is a uh, one neural with a parameter X. So, yeah, sigma is like a nonlinear uh, application function. So, that's, uh, this is one neural. And we take the expectation with respect to the parameter X. So, this is a uh, a kind of infinite basis neural network where that we have an infinite many neurons, we take the other base. So that can be written something like this. Okay. Uh, so we want to optimize this distribution. So this is a, this is a distribution of the parameters of the neurons. Okay, so for that purpose, we prepare some loss function in right. So this we assume this loss function is a convex, like a squared loss or logistic loss, whatever. But because f mu is a linear to this is a linear functional of the distribution mu. So this loss function is a convex function of the distribution mu. Okay. So then and we, we, we can also add some to the like this. So then uh, if you employ uh, this object as a f, so then the corresponding mean field Langevin dynamics is given by like this. Okay. So this dynamics gives us okay, so we have an infinite many neurons, like each neuron has a parameter xt, its dynamics is given by this, this equation. So there are many other applications like uh, non-parameter density estimation by minimizing mean, uh, maximum mean discrepancy or the variation inference or for uh, approximating the phase and posterior. But uh, yeah, so I, uh, you, you just need you just uh, you just need to consider uh, the uh, optimizing mean. Okay. So this is what I want to show in this part. Okay. So uh, now, so I, I'm interested in the convergence of the mean field arrangements. So. Yeah, here is a, a, a general result of the, the, the components. So the Nitanda, U, and Suzuki show the linear convergence of the mean field grand chance. And then Pichita also show the same result, or almost the same time. And based on this general result, we have developed the so-called double loop method. So this is a, a kind of a completely discretized version. So instead of an infinite bit network, we consider finite networks, a uh, neural network, and we consider discrete time dynamics. We can construct a uh, some new method uh, with a convergence guarantee that is given by this method. So PA is a particle dual analytic method, and the PSDC is a particle stochastic dual coordinate method that shows a exponential convergence. And, and we have also uh, uh, proposed an infinite dimensional extension of the business. 
Yeah. So this is these are the first methods that achieve the polynomial order convergence of the mean field function. Okay. But I, the, the, but but it, this is a kind of a double loop method. In, 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 so in the inner loop, we need to do execute some NCMC something. So it's if you implement implementation is a little bit complicated. So we want to consider more um, sim simple methods. But that's a single loop method without the double loop implementation. So we want to do a kind of one step method. So that is a single loop method. But uh, the analysis of a single loop method is very difficult. So because there is a Kind, a kind of theoretical difficulty called uh, the propagation of chaos. Uh, but I think that the French mathematicians are very strong at this problem, and they have a long history about the propagation of chaos. But last year there was uh, some theoretical development, and then so we can obtain uh, some kind of commodities result, a commodity found for a single loop result. Okay, so thanks. Uh, the last few minutes, I give just an uh, overview of the bound for a single loop result. Okay, so this is a mean field arrangement. So what we want to do is first we, we want to discretize the time. So because this is a continuous time dynamics, we, we take the time discretization like this. This is our Euler Marian scheme. And so and the distribution mu t is uh, um, approximated by finite particle. So this means that we approximate infinite with the neural network by a finite field network. And in addition to that, we approximate this gradient term by a stochastic gradient. For example, if you if you are using some well, big data, so we want to use some mini batch running. So so yeah, then you can do that. So here eta k is a set size. So there appear the three approximations: the time discretization, stochastic gradient approximation, space uh, finite bits of discretization. We need to evaluate all of them. So actually, so we can show the this mechanism. We can we can bound those discretization error like this. And this is our kind of a, so, so one step one step improvement. Right? So this is our objective function. Objective function decrease is the rate of this one. And there appears additional uh, three approximation errors. So, but anyway, so we can bound those approximation errors like this. But using this kind of analysis, so uh, we can bound the the, the exact uh, so the, uh, well, we, we can bound the error. Of the, after the k step of the stochastic gradient type mean field arrangement lines like this. So if, if you set the uh, step size and the, the number of iterations of precise, uh, appropriately, you can achieve the each non accuracy. Okay, so the right hand side can be bounded by each one. And if you set the mean size appropriately, so this is like a log each one over each one. So this is almost the same as the, the commodity state of a stochastic gradient descent for that to optimize a strongly convex object much. Yeah, so this kind of theory can be used for further development of theories. For example, you can apply this kind of result to analyze uh, some well, statistical properties of the estimators so optimized by the, the, this kind of mean field neural network. So yeah, so if you want, if you want to do something like that, so you can use this, this result. Okay, so this is our, uh, the summary. Okay, so um, so. I think that there are many things that should be done to, uh, that should be done in the future works. So the analysis of the mini map optimal diffusion model. So we have achieved many strong conditions. And maybe so we can deduct well, some something like that uh, as those assumptions. And and also we don't know why the large language models like Chat GPT work so well. So we need more theories about that. So I hope we can have some cooperation. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. So, thank you. Very, very interesting. Uh, for the first part, uh, so to achieve minimax optimality, I, I guess one could use a much simpler method. And for instance, you spoke about the method of, of Berthe, which doesn't use a, doesn't use a diffusion models, it just uses like wavelets and stuff. But the method is, is very slow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, especially I mentioned. So, do you think uh, there is some gain? Because here you get minimax rate, but okay. is it is it uh, numerically efficient? I, I think so. You you mentioned that by using the wavelet uh, wavelet basis functions, you can do the thing state estimation. You, I think you yes, do, you they use density, the and then they do this. But this is something that never works in practice because nobody can use wavelet in practice. Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, I did my PhD on wavelet uh, twenty years ago. So yeah, no, so I, I know I know it doesn't work. Yeah, so actually, in terms of density estimation, the, the uh, wavelet expand, wavelet, wavelet method also achieves the sort of same rate of But uh, here, so the uh, diffusion model can do the sampling. 
So uh, it is our landing advantage of the future model. So, well, okay, so you said, so, so the rate of commands could, doesn't have some meaning, so yeah. But, uh, but one good point is that, so there's some adaptation to the rotation property, so yeah, rotation structure. So, so even though we don't know that some structure of the support of the distribution, so the diffusion models are deeply analyzed, but model can find uh, where is the support, so then it can avoid a kind of causal being right? So the dependency or the dimensionality is much, much The question is not on the convergence yeah. speed, it's on the speed of the algorithm. Speed or algorithm? Yes, because here you have an algorithm that ah, okay. runs. Uh, how fast it is, what is the time yeah. complexity? Because here it's sample complexity, ah, but okay. uh, for instance, wavelets they have the same sample complexity, but the time complexity is horrible. I mean, it's like exponential in the dimension. Or... Uh, the time compressed, you mean the uh, number of operations, the number of CPU per, or GPU operation you need to train or input? Have the function of n, is it like n to the power d? Or? Uh, well, in terms of the, the for inference or training? So, I guess both. I mean, well, both of them. The okay. inference is fast, but uh, I guess okay. training is maybe uh, maybe the bottom. So in, in, behind this uh, theorem, so we are using a kind of wavelet expansion. So, <laughs> so in the proof, uh, we are using a wavelet network transfer. So, it, it, so based on that proof, the complete force is all the same. Yeah. So, but it, well, so yeah. Maybe I think that in practice, uh, the structure is much more simpler, and then, so there. That just neural net, computing the, the neural network is much more, yeah, much much more faster than using the, the yes. n basis function. So it it, it, it compresses the kind of function uh, function structures. Mm -hmm. But but it is not that the future model is computationally demanding. Mm -hmm. There are many techniques to faster faster neural network. Yeah. Thanks for the nice talk. I also have a question about here. So in the previous slide, you showed, you showed with the TV distance, total radiation distance, you suffer from the, the cross thing, right? Yeah. But in the Wasser Stein distance, you, you don't. Right. Well, what does it mean? Ah, okay, okay. okay. Um, it, it's not because changing the distribution, the distance, but it, um, in this case, we cannot define the TV distance. So because the TV distance, is, if you consider the K divided, you need to compute the density ratio. Uh, it so is basically to different problem. Yeah, different problem. Uh, yeah. So we cannot define the TV distance in this setting. So yeah, we also have the same rate of convergence versus the same distance. Uh, no, no. Uh, we, we can also compute the versus the distance for this problem. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, maybe. Yeah, okay. In that same this setting, the so versus the distance has a faster rate. Yes, yeah, actually, we have a faster rate for the, the same, same, same setting. So, uh, okay, so this is a little bit difficult to. Explain it. Uh, okay, so TV distance is actually basically based on the, the density ratio of the two distributions. So this is a little bit harder to find. But in a lot of same distance, the density ratio is not necessarily to be bounded, so it's more easier to be bound. So we have a fast time. And does it mean in, in practice, what can we learn from that? Well, like you have two different error metrics. Yeah. Mean, one metric, the method is poor, and the, the other method, the other metric, the method is actually not doing well. But in practice, it's mm -hmm. the same algorithm. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, so we, we can take it more positive way. I mean, so it can achieve the this rate for any um, evaluation criteria. Okay. So if we, we cannot say this is a poor, because uh, comparing the two different uh, quantity, uh, yeah. Uh, evaluation criteria, so you cannot say which one is better, mm -hmm. just a change the difference of the evaluation, mm -hmm. uh, evaluation criteria. So both, for both um, criteria, you obtain the, um, the rate, uh, optimal rate, so that, that means that the diffusion model has a kind of good, very good uh, adaptivity or good properties, so that, that can be optimal for many uh, criteria. Yeah. Thank you very much. So any other questions? So thanks a lot. So it's a great pleasure to be here. It's actually fantastic to be here. I wanted to come here for several years and combining uh, pleasure with work, with prairie, with Rican, it's like a, like a global uh, optimum. <laughs> okay, so today I want to speak a bit about theory and theory of a deep network in some sense. 
but this would be, so then this would be about optimization. It would not be about like this network is better or worse, it would just be like a very simple equation. Can you optimize network and, and what type of network could you optimize? Uh, also, the idea is to try to understand like this, uh, give some insight about uh, this principle that if you have a lot of neurons, then optimization seems to be simpler. In the sense that if you train a very deep and very large network, it tends to always somehow be able to overfit the data and converge to almost zero loss, so interpolation regime somehow. And it's one of the many mystery of deep learning, and to, to the best of my knowledge, this is really like a total open problem. So I'm not going to solve uh, this open problem for sure. Um, and, and also one, one basic question is what does it mean to have a lot of neurons? It could be very large, it could be very deep, so there's a lot of variation on it, so it's also something that uh, I want to discuss a bit. Um, and also just uh, as a disclaimer, this would be mostly theory, so of course we'll be doing a lot of uh, very simplification, but the goal is somehow to try to uh, to take some insight from the practice, so at least some of the points they would be uh, semi-realistic, so unfortunately for Jean, this would not really be totally uh, uh, in line with what uh, people do in state-of-the-art method, but still, I will show you some models that convey some insights, and if you try on ImageNet, you still give reasonable accuracy. Okay, so it's not like just an MLP that could never work on ImageNet. Uh, okay, so that's the pitch. Uh, hope you stay on board. Uh, also, it's a joint work with uh, Raphael and François Xavier. So Raphael is our current uh, PhD uh, uh, student, and we're working on in this area for this one, one year now. Um, okay, so uh, just to start, uh, maybe a, a few uh, explanations about the models. This would be like ResNet model. So I guess most of you are familiar with it, but maybe it's good to just recap uh, what it means. And also uh, why in this type of model you can really consider a lot of layer, and in, in fact even goes to the infinite uh, depth limits, uh, which is one of the goals. One of the goals is to say that we use a lot of depth, very deep network, so could it even make sense to use an infinite number of, of, of layers? And then you could also come back to finite number of layers, but it's good to have a mathematics that don't break if you have too much, much layer. You want to consider a lot of layers, so it should also be compatible with the infinite limits, which is not the case for most of the theory. Actually, I've never seen a theorem that if you look in the theorem and you take infinite number of neurons, does it still work? I mean, it's maybe yes, but the author never really uh, explained it. So here we tackle directly from the start infinite uh, depth, let's go for it. So first of all, uh, maybe uh, you all know what is a ResNet, but this is what you obtain if you uh, import uh, from PyTorch, and I guess it's the same on TensorFlow, so each uh, library has slight difference in the way they, they have their models, but, but more or less it looks like this, so it looks like very complicated. This is a uh, ResNet 34, so it's like basically uh, uh, 34 layers that are stacked, it's like a convolutive uh, layer. Uh, but if you look closely, you would notice that each uh, ResNet, they basically have uh, four components, this is the component, okay, uh, which are actually small uh, sub-network that operate on the same dimension. Okay, and this is super important because this is really what uh, we will consider. And if you want to make uh, the model deeper, this is only this part that you uh, make deeper. Okay, the red part, they always stay the same thing. In all ResNet uh, architecture, you have uh, four blocks, and then the number you have here just tell you how much here this uh, inner, uh, inner loop, in some sense, they are deeper or not, okay? So uh, just to recap, the red layer, they, uh, they modify the dimension, so they make you go to higher dimension or to smaller dimension, and then you get a lot of inner loops that operate like this. Okay, and, and, and of course, the, the key ingredient of ResNet, the true revolution, is this loop connection. So basically, before ResNet, you take a classical ResNet, and you make it deep, deeper, at some time it starts working. You don't really know why it starts to stop working, maybe it's just because the optimizer doesn't work anymore, Maybe because the, the model is not good, maybe too deep uh, CNN doesn't work. But really, if you do the experiment and you take too deep uh, classical uh, network, it stops working. And the revolution, why ResNet is so cited, is because it's a really simple idea that suddenly you can take as many uh, layers as you want and it still continues to work. Of course, at some, at some point, if you make it too deep, it's very dumb because it becomes very computationally expensive. So you don't want to make it too deep. But at least it's the recipes that make it work. And the trick is really this deep connection. Instead of, the, of doing xt is v of xt minus 1, so v is whatever, it's like typically a convolution and a, a non-linearity, you make xt and you re-inject the input inside the output. So of course, for, for, for being able to do this, you need to stay in the same dimension. Okay, but you see there is a feedback loop. Okay, so it's not totally fit forward. Uh, you have this uh, skip connection. And what is the insight? The insight is if you want to make a lot of layer uh, stacked together, you need to recenter the layer around the identity. What you want to make uh, small is actually this part will be small, 
And in fact, what is super cool with the ResNet, you can even initialize with zero. So if you initialize a CNN with zero, uh, the optimization breaks. But here with ResNet, you can even say uh, my, my, my input, my initial, sorry, uh, uh, DeepNet is just zero. And what does it do? It just do identity. So it's still what it do with DeepNet. So good result, but you can initialize at zero. So you can do perfectly deterministic, almost deterministic uh, training. Okay, so really the, the, the true evolution is super simple. And I think it's why the Piper is so cited, it's because it's very good compromise because uh, between a very simple ID and a huge impact. So like one line of uh, equation uh, gives you a thousand of citation, thousand, uh, ten of thousand of citation. Okay, so of course now you see uh, where I'm, I'm aiming, what, what the goal is, is to make not only three uh, steep connections, but make more and more connections. And instead of having a discrete evolution, then somehow the inside is you would converge to like a continuous evolution. Okay, so be very careful in my talk when I let, make a letter T, so it's like a, a time if you want, but it's not a physical time, it's just a depth. Okay, when you evolve in the network, it's like a time evolution. Okay, but it's not the time of the optimization, it's really the time of your features that evolve and become more and more uh, complicated. Okay, so just to formalize a bit with equations, so this is the equation with RedNet, but of course, if you want to make the number of them, very important point is if you want to really train a very, very deep network, what you need is somehow to normalize. Okay, and if you see uh, the inside, the inside is you want this to model a continuous evolution. So you want xt plus one to be xt plus some time step, time, uh, time, time your, 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 your connection. And of course, if you want this time step to, to, to want more and more, uh, layer, then you need this time step to be smaller and smaller. So for instance, and I will discuss this after, you can make if you put in front this in here a one over capital T. So of course in terms of, uh, of, of architecture it doesn't change anything because you can integrate this one over T inside the V. But mathematically speaking it's very important to put this. And also in practice if you do the training and something you can train at home, if you train a very very deep ResNet, not uh, 34 but like uh, much much bigger, then you really need to put something in, in front otherwise uh, the optimization will, will break. But here with this what is going to be the limit? You do just 60 plus 1 minus 60 divided by the time step, and it converges to an ordinary uh, differential equation, saying that now the continuous trajectory, it's so like a mathematical abstraction, uh, becomes an evolution in some type, of a, some type of a virtual time, if you want, which is the derivative of time of x is equal to your layer. Okay, and at each time you have a different layer, so the parameter here, sorry, c'est pas, maybe I should use a for you like this, so theta depends on t at each time you have a, a, a different uh, set of parameters. So usually people call this neural OD. I don't know if they are the first to, to, to explain this because it looks like everybody in control theory they do this for ages. But it's a very nice paper because they do the connection. They explain uh, the connection with uh, optimal uh, control. And they explain you can train this type of network with classical methods from optimal transport, uh, control. So it's kind of a very, very nice paper. Uh, now the question is, can you train uh, this type of, of network and can you uh, optimize them uh, correctly? One thing I want to stress also is that when you take the limit of infinite number of layers, this is a very weird limit, it's kind of a singular limit, because here of course since uh, these are like discrete trajectory, the discrete trajectories they can be anything. For instance, they could cross. If you want to model a minus identity, you want to reverse the space, of course you can do it. But here, at least if the vector fields are nice enough, then you have a Cauchy-Lipschitz Co theorem, the most important theorem in, uh, in OD, will tell you that there is a solution, and the solution they can never cross. They can become closer and closer, but there is a singularity that can never cross. So for instance, uh, here, in, imagine this is like a 1D space, you can never reverse the space with a neural OD. Which kind of, kind of a problem, and you will, you will see this showing, showing up in the, in the optimization, it will cause problem. Well, it's something very important to remember. So, uh, of course, if you are in very high dimension, maybe not being able to reverse the orientation is not a big deal. I'm not saying it's going to be a big problem in practice, but this is something to remember. When you take the limit, something weird uh, should happen. So, that's the limit for what? The horizontal axis is time. Yes, the horizontal axis is the value of x. Yes, so the horizontal axis is like time if you want, but it's like depth. Because when you move along the trajectory, it means you, you move in the network. Okay, so what the network does is taking input points and mapping them to uh, points. Okay, so maybe just to, to come back to this here. Each of these little blocks, what they do is they take groups of points and then they move it here. 
Okay, so people that are fashionable, they call this normalizing flow, I mean, it has many names, but this is just like an advection equation, a take point and you move them around. And advection equation, they can never uh, reverse the space. Determinant of the Jacobian is positive. Okay, so, uh, so the, the unit is a bit singular, so we have to be a bit careful. Uh, just a little remark for also, if you're not into this business, it's not a big deal, but I think something to remember is uh, the, the time step you put here, so the normalization of your layer actually plays a very important role. So in my talk, I would do what I think is very natural and probably the, I mean, the way I think is uh, the, the theory should be done is the deterministic theory. I choose a, a step one over t, whatever the problem, it will always converge to somehow a nice trajectory. There are some previous work, I know I these two papers, but I guess there are others that are interested in these settings. But what they do is they consider like random Gaussian uh, weights, okay? But then they don't take a 1 over t uh, step. They take a 1 over square root of t, which is a, a, a bit similar to the previous talk with diffusion model. But if you do this, so remember here the, the step size is much stronger. When you let t goes to zero, you will not kill the noise. And what happens is the neural network at convergence, so I mean, when you take infinite depth, it converges to a stochastic neural network, which I think is pretty weird, but why not? Which means if you give him an input, but you re-randomize the problem, it will, uh, the, the initialization, it will converge to like, some different position. So formally, in terms of mathematics, what you obtain in the limit is a stochastic uh, differential equation where you have a drift that you want to, to learn, but uh, you also have a uh, Brunan motion. Okay? Uh, I think this is not supernatural. I think in very high dimension, it's not clear uh, stochastic OD should work, but why not? But this is not what I'm going to speak about, and I know no theorems for, for optimization about this. So, so uh, why we like this? It's better to think of the time. But just to give you some pointers, so look at this. Uh, particular, these are French people, so it's very good. Uh, it's just a question. Yeah. It doesn't go back, right? Say, so, no, here it's just from left to right, and here from left to right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you're going back. No, but here, you're, okay, yeah, there's many ways to interpret this. Uh, here I'm in 2D, so the points are in 2D, and they evolve in time, so you could evolve anywhere. So here the pseudo space is 2D, and the time is not like this, the time is along the trajectory. If you want. Okay, it's just like, but anyway, it's not a big deal to understand really what the picture means, but I think you get the idea. This is random and this is deterministic. Yeah, but if you like randomness, I think the, the right hand side is, 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 is really, really cool. Okay, so what do you want to know? Do you know, sorry, uh, you want to train the neural network. So here in my, in my work, we'll focus on the single uh, blocks and we will model what happened before and what af after by like two operators A and B. Okay, and when we're doing the, when we will doing, so in the theory, we assume A is a linear operator. Okay, so for the theory, we make a very strong and simplified assumption. What happened before your neural, uh, whatever, OD, is just a, a linear operator. And after, we could actually be non-linear, but I think in my talk, I will assume everything is linear. We focus on the training, a single uh, residual uh, block, okay? And, uh, and here is the discrete, when you have a finite number of, of layers, so just a, a classical ResNet, and here it's going to be what happens if you take an infinite number of layers. Inside, what you have here is a neural OD. Okay, and the goal in life, or at least when you do this, is to train the setup. Is a continuous setup or a discrete set of setup. And what do you do in practice if you do deep network? You just train with a least square. Because why do something complicated when you can do something very simple? You just minimize a least square about uh, on your parameters. Okay, which looks simple on paper, but of course it's very hard. Because everything is nonlinear, so this is actually a very uh, non-convex problem. Okay. Also, something important here is uh, we don't regularize anything. We just don't put uh, reach. We don't put anything uh, because in practice, I mean, most people they actually never. I mean, they regularize very very little. Okay. So so here I think it's very important to have a theory that don't depend on regularization. Because of course, if I put here a very strong regularization, the problem somehow would be a bit convex and. And the proof would be super simple. Okay, so there are some papers that do proof on convergence with regularization, but if you check in their paper, when the regularization goes to zero, the proof doesn't work. Okay, so, so for me, it's very important that if you do a proof with, with, with regularization, it should still work when the, there's no regularization. Because otherwise, it means you're doing a study that don't cover what people do in practice, which is no regularization and what people call implicit bias. Implicit bias is the regularization or, or the, the proof techniques should work to uh, capture what's happening during the optimization and should not rely on you put uh, x square loss in, 
Let me discuss penalty on you. So a very important feature is uh, is purely uh, no regularization. Okay, so what are the previous work on this type of question? I think the one very highly cited uh, previous work is the NTK. So we not do a course on NTK if you if you if you know about NTK, well, well good for you. If you don't know, I think it's not super important because what you do is just a local Taylor expansion around the minimizer, and you replace your function with a quadratic function. And, and, and then, of course, life is simple because it's quadratic and you can do a lot of things. But the problem is going to be a very local theorem. Okay, because it relies on the fact that you are very close to the minimizer. And I think it's good to do a proof a bit more uh, subtle, where you don't linearize everything and everything becomes convex. So you, you like to still uh, have something that is a bit uh, more realistic. Uh, there are some works, this is what I'm going to, to tell you about, uh, which is called uh, Polnyak Wojtyevich. Okay. This is not an L, it's an L with a little. So, so the L here should be called W, so it should be spelled W. So it's Poliak uh, Low Wojtyevich, sorry. So PR, okay. PR condition is a very nice condition that, that basically generalizes this quadratic expansion, so you don't need to do the quadratic expansion. So I'm going to do a little course on this PL because I think it's a great, great condition. It's the simplest condition ever for optimization, and it's, it's very nice to do the proof with this. Uh, and they are previous work on this, but they only work in the finite dimension. So they would typically break when uh, the number of layers goes to plus infinity. And here the goal is really to be able to do the proof even when you have an infinite number of layers. So we'll do directly the proof with the infinite depths. Okay? Uh, and of course, in the simple, I mean, in the simple case where you only have two layers, and this was uh, mentioned before, there are some very strong theory. For instance, the paper of uh, Lenaik, uh, Shiza, and Francis Bag, but there are also a lot of other papers by uh, Andrea Montanari and so on. That basically says the theorem is true when you get only two layers. No ResNet, just two layers. You can use uh, an infinite number of neurons and uh, you get global convergence. There is no PL, it works for any initialization. It's, uh, it's an amazingly strong theorem, but of course it doesn't work when you have a deeper network. So here we want to prove this for a deeper network, but of course the theorem would be much weaker. All right, so what is this uh, PL? So I want to make a mini course on PL. So PL is this condition. We just say that, so here for simplicity, I assume that global optimum is at zero. Otherwise, you just subtract so that the optimality is a zero loss. And you just want F to be bounded by its, the square of its gradient. Okay? It doesn't need to be convex, but somehow the typical function that satisfies this is the function x squared. So it's a strongly convex function. Strongly convex function, they, they, they work. But in fact, what is nice with this, it can still be in a convex, and this is a typical example of a, of a PL function. A banana shaped function is that you take a strongly convex function and you deform it, but also you can be, uh, the set of minimizer can just be uh, not a singleton, but a, a single point. Okay, so PL function, they allow you to deal with uh, non convex or slightly non convex function, and also uh, not unique minimizer. Which is what we want because here we are going to train super over parameterized models, so the set of minimizer is going to be gigantic. Okay? But what happens is when you move away from the minimizer, you get this kind of a quadratic, uh, quadratic behavior. And the theorem, and this is called uh, Pierre, basically, this was introduced by, by Poliak in some paper and it's related to, uh, to, to some theory on semi algebraic geometry, which was studied a long time ago by mathematician. Anyway, and then you do gradient descent, so typically you assume your function is smooth. You take a step size that is smaller than one over the smoothness, and boom, you have this very simple theorem, and the proof is really like two lines. It's the simplest uh, theorem ever. It doesn't tell you that uh, the theta they converge, because if the function is nasty, you could imagine theta actually don't converge, but the function value converge, and converge uh, linearly, so it means at each iteration, you get some uh, constant factor that decays. It's kind of a fast, uh, a fast rate of convergence, okay? Uh, and this is going to be to be found in, in the old paper by by Poliak. Okay, so it's a, it's a, it's a very nice thing, and you can see that what happens is you get the trajectories that don't converge to the same point, of course. Depending on the initialization, you get different type of implicit bias, but it always converges to the to the global uh, minimizer, which makes total sense on this picture, and it's not very complicated, but it's nice to have a, to have a nice chart. Uh, why it why is it a problem? For the problem we want to study. So, why PL is, is too strong? Uh, it's too strong because, well, it's too strong. And you can really see this even on a very simple case. In the case where uh, there's no nonlinearity, so the network is linear, and at each layer you use the same weight. Okay, so it's the most simplest neural network ever. You just apply the same 
uh, matrix over and over, which means you want to control this uh, OD. Theta dot is equal to, uh, sorry, x dot derivative in time equal to theta times x, whose solution, if you have uh, done some course on OD, is just the exponential of theta times x. Okay, so here when I say exponential, is the matrix exponential. So if you are in one disk, yeah. exponential and theta, but in one disk, two symbols. So in two disk, you need to take the matrix exponential, which means you compute the eigenvalue uh, factorization, and you exponentiate the eigenvalue. If you don't know what is a matrix exponential, it's just a complex, uh, complicated stuff, but, but you can compute it. So imagine you have a lot of data and you want to train to learn uh, the uh, uh, symmetry. You want to symmetrize your data. You want to turn the x into minus x, which more or less, if you get a lot of data sets, you want to minimize the, the distance between exponential of theta and minus identity. Okay, so this is a function you want to train in a very, very simple thing. You hope in this case it should work, right? Uh, and you do gradient descent. In fact, you can compute almost everything in closed form, at least in a, in a special case, if you initialize with a, with a matrix who can be diagonalized in an orthogonal basis. Okay, it's called, in mathematics it's called a normal matrix, but whatever. So you can, uh, if you initialize with a matrix that you can diagonalize, and you assume the eigenvector are orthogonal, okay? In fact, what is beautiful with this uh, flow is, uh, in fact, the diagonal, the eigenvector, they stay the same. So during the optimization, the eigenvector stays the same, only the eigenvalue evolves. Okay, and the eigenvalues are just the sets of complex numbers. So you have a matrix, you compute the eigenvalues, they are complex uh, numbers, and you, during the training of your network, what happens in the eigenvalues, they, they move. Okay, and what is even simpler is they move according to a super simple function, they minimize the square of exponential of z plus one. Well, here, exponential is a classical uh, exponential of, of complex vector. So the function you minimize is just the square of exponential z plus one. So you think it's going to be trivial. Actually, if you plot this function, it's a mess. I mean, it's a semi-mess, I would say. Uh, the reason if you want is because it doesn't satisfy PL. But if you look in practice what happened, this is supposed to be the global minimizer. So the, the imaginary part is zero, and you want to converge to this. Uh, but you see that if you initialize here or here, what happens is your uh, real part is going to diverge to minus infinity. So here are the red dots are you initialize with different type of matrix, and you see where, where it works. So you see that in most of the case, it converges to the global minimizer. But if you're unlucky, there is this type of very weird uh, reach okay, that net you wave goes to uh, minus infinity. Okay? So more what happens is it works everywhere, except as a few initialization point where the network will blows. It will blows why? Because if you initialize with imaginary part equal to zero, okay, uh, in fact, theta will be stopped at zero. You want to, you, you initialize with plus one and you will go to minus one, but you go in straight line and you will block at zero and you never converge. Okay? So, uh, and the reason for this is because of course this doesn't satisfy, I mean, of course, this doesn't satisfy uh, PI inequality. So, uh, so somehow you need something a, a, a bit weaker. And it turns out that this has been introduced actually uh, in several related papers uh, under many names, but it's more like corresponds to uh, a local polyac relation condition. Instead of saying that the gradient should be always smaller than the constant time f, you allow your constant to vary uh, with the amplitude of your weight. So basically, uh, what happens is, unfortunately, this constant it will become smaller and smaller, so the problem will become harder and harder as theta uh, grows larger and larger. And for instance, on this uh, simple problem, you can show that it doesn't satisfy uh, Classical pair, so uniform pair everywhere, because there is this kind of a value here that, that prevents you to have a pair condition, uh, but it satisfies a pair condition with this function m that is unfortunately exponentially bad as the amplitude of the eigenvalues grows. Okay, so this is the first ingredient. The first ingredient is you lower bound, but with something that depends on the position. And the other ingredient is you want to prevent the point to go to, to, to blow the way. And to prevent the point to blow the way, what you need to introduce is not only a lower bound on the gradient, but also an upper bound. Okay, so to have a local PL, you need both to lower bound the gradient and to upper bound your gradient. Okay, uh, this was introduced in a, I mean, not exactly this way, but more or less, in a paper by Liu Zhu and Belkin, that was studying also uh, some hard training of, of, of network. And in this particular case, you can show that it's true 
And for finitely, the lower bound is exponentially bad, and the upper bound is exponentially bad. But this is a price to pay, I mean, you cannot cope with it. But under this hypothesis, what you can show is you can still show uh, linear convergence long side, so it will still converge to the global minimizer at a linear rate, but the catch is it's not, you cannot initialize everywhere. You need to initialize at a point which is close enough to the, to the minimizer. So they call this global convergence because it converges to the global minimizer, but you cannot initialize everywhere. So it's like a local, global, I mean, I don't know how to call this term, but, but if you initialize basically in this area, it converges to the global minimizer. If you initialize outside, it diverges. Okay, so I think it's both that's half full and half empty. If you satisfy this, there is no local minima, there is no standard point. And every point where the gradient is zero is a global minimizer. So here the gradient never vanish, but the trick is it vanish at infinity. Okay, so it's kind of a weird function. I mean, before doing this one, I've never seen this type of function. So. But apparently, it's what happened in this regime where, I mean, you can have a very, very deep uh, network. Okay, so now the whole goal is to be able to prove this, but in, in more generic or more general uh, nonlinear network. Okay, uh, so how do you do this? So, well, uh, just, just take a step back. Uh, what we will consider is a simplification of, of, of reality. So, so if you look at what, what you do in, um, in practice, if you look at what is a residual block, usually what you do is you, you get uh, a perceptron or a convolution network, uh, if you do image processing. Where first you have uh, typically a first layer that increases the dimension, then a nonlinearity, and then an output layer that reduces the dimension. It's a typical uh, scenario for a residual block. Uh, and and, and, and the, the dimension you can have here, the number of inner uh, or hidden weight, could be, could be very large to model very complex deformation. So if you were to train really a neural network as you would do, you would train both the inner and the outer weight. And to the best, I mean, we didn't. But we were not able to do the proof in this setting, it's super complicated. So what we propose is a simplification, uh, admittedly a huge simplification, is to only train the outer uh, layer. So the inner layer is kept fixed, quickly random, and you only train the outer layer. Why is it much simpler? It's because of course, the uh, layer itself, the deformation, depends linearly on the outer layer. So if you simplify a lot the proof, but of course, still the, non the network is nonlinear because you apply this a lot of time over and over. So globally, the transformation is very nonlinear. You can model very nonlinear deformation. But locally, at each uh, step of your algorithm, or your, the, the, when you go in depth, the parametrization is linear. Okay? Uh, and what does it correspond to mathematically? For those who are into kernel methods, they would love uh, this, of course. Because this corresponds to doing uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space uh, parametrization of your layer. Okay, so basically, when you optimize only on the outer layer, it just means that you consider a norm on your uh, deformation field, which is just the norm of the outer layer. Okay, so if you think in terms of kernels, it means you consider as a feature, I mean, this part is like a feature, completely feature, and then you do the inner product on the feature space. And this defines the kernel. So depending on your sigma, and depending on the distribution of your weight, you get the kernel you want. So you can do Gaussian kernel, Laplacian kernel, uh, or no, more complicated kernel, and this has been, of course, studied a lot uh, uh, 20, from 20 years ago, so it's, it's now very, uh, very well understood. Also, what is nice with RKHS is you can consider a finite number of, uh, of neurons, which is a finite dimensional RKHS, but you can also consider infinite widths, okay? and this gives you an infinite dimensional RKHS. So, all theory works both in finite widths, infinite dimensional widths, and infinite more infinite dimensional depth. Okay, so we are infinite in both uh, directions. Okay, so just to recap, when you do gradient descent in the ResNet, but you only train the outer weight, is exactly equivalent, it's just a reformulation, of doing a gradient descent in a RKHS, RKHS space of deformation. All right, this is, I mean, this is just like one-to-one, -one. it's just a, a nice mathematical way to rewrite the same. Okay, so recap what we want to do. We uh, want to train uh, some neural OD. Initially, we would like to train the inner and the outer weight, but now we do a simplification. We just want to train the outer weight, which means that we want to train the vector field, okay, that deforms progressively your data, uh, into uh, RKHS. Okay? And, and uh, you want to do this by minimizing always the same function, uh, your least square. Okay? So there's move from here to here. It's simply the fact that you train only the outer layer in each of your uh, residual. Okay. 
So of course, it's a, it's a huge simplification and it will be simpler to study. Uh, now you can ask, can I just use a download from archive the latest paper and apply it to this? I think it's not trivial, I think it doesn't work because uh, even if you can prove some pair condition on uh, the finite dimensional case, if you take a deeper and deeper architecture, uh, the proof will break. Okay, it's just because you need some hypothesis. You cannot do this at home with any kernel. You need some hypothesis on your kernel. You need to, to, to have some hypothesis so that it still works when the depth goes to present. So really, the, the goal we want to achieve is really to prove this famous PL condition directly on this equation with a normal network with an arbitrary number of depths, even uh, possibly infinite dimensional depths. And to be able to achieve this, there's no free lunch. You need some hypothesis. And I think it's what is, is super cool. People that don't like additional hypothesis, but I think it's very important because it tells you what hypothesis do you need if you want your theory still to work and it gives you some information about uh, the type of model you want to consider. And okay, this is just an uh, experimental uh, slide to say it still cannot work in practice because you could argue this model is so simple it will never work. And uh, I, I was assuming it will never work, but we did some tests and it seems to still work, meaning that if you freeze uh, the uh, inner weight and you only optimize the outer weight, you can still achieve quite good accuracy, accuracy that, wa that were similar to what you have with the classical ResNet, like it is a small ResNet arguably, where you train both weights together. Okay, this is certainly not state of the art. If you go to ImageNet and you do this, first of all, it would be super costly because remember we want to have a, a lot, a lot of layers, so 20 is maybe not a lot and you can do a, a, a little more, but, but even with very, very deep architecture, with this idea of just uh, optimizing the outer weight, you can still do uh, quite good performance. Performance that are much better than, than very simple models that are not good. Okay, but once again, it's not state of the art. It's just a proof of concept that says you can still classify quite good with this model. And the next thing is we can do a bit of theory. Okay? So, not state of the art, but still cannot be able to, to train and to learn very deep uh, architecture. So, I think I'm quite out of time, but just, just to say uh, what you need. So what are the type of hypotheses you need uh, on your model to work? The first thing is you need your deformation field to be smooth, okay? So normally what you want is, first of all, you need uh, vector field in your cases to be bounded, okay? otherwise nothing will work. You need to be Lipschitz. It makes sense because if you want, uh, if you know Cauchy Lipschitz, the Lipschitz from Cauchy Lipschitz is because your vector field is Lipschitz. So you also need to bound the derivative of your vector field, uh, which is fine. Uh, and the other thing we needed is if you want to be able to do a finite, uh, a gradient descent with a finite step, you also unfortunately need to want the second derivative. Okay, it's not an issue if you are able to use very small step size, but if you want to use a finite step size, uh, this prevents you to use ROLU. We think for ROLU, you probably need very, I mean, much smaller step size, which is an interesting remark. And I think it's true for almost all theory I know about, like even the theory of Linnaeus and back, there are problems with ROLU. So doing really end-to-end uh, uh, -end proof with ROLU, I think, is, uh, is, is more tricky. Uh, so just to be to be clear, um, you can use uh, any nonlinearity. For instance, if you just want your classical kernel that you love, like a Matin kernel or, or Gaussian kernel or Laplacian kernel, you can use an exponential nonlinearity or cosinus and sinus, and then you recover all the kernel you, you like. So if this is what what we used previously for the numerics, we actually use this kernel, which is, in my opinion, the best kernel. The Laplacian kernel is super good, uh, which is the one we use in high dimension and it works kind of well. But the theory works with kernel that are smooth, first point. Uh, the other thing you need is you need your data not to be the point not too close together. So you're going to compute deformation, and at some point, what you would need is that uh, the local kernel, so the empirical kernel in, uh, in RKHS, needs to be well conditioned. So, of course, because of kernel, you know uh, such a kernel is always a positive matrix. But here, you need, you need a bit more. You need it to be uh, well conditioned. You need its lambda, its uh, smallest eigenvalue, to be strictly positive. So in our theory, to be able to describe what it means, uh, we quantify this as a function of the distance between the points. Because of course, if your points are very, very close together, your empirical kernel would be worse and worse, and the optimization would, would get crazy. Okay, so this is a, a key ingredient in the proof, is to control this lambda. So if you want to see what is the best kernel, the best kernel should be a kernel for which this lambda should not be too small. But this depends on your data, so it's not, of course, uh, always easy to compute, but but, uh, but this is something that we show in the book. Okay, and this is uh, the main theorem from our paper. There's a lot of, 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 of equations everywhere. But basically, it tells you that if your input data at the input of your network, so your data set, uh, the points are not too close together, then you would have this famous uh, local field condition. 
if you initialize with the loss that is small enough, it will converge at exponential speed toward uh, the global minimizer. And you can compute everything in closed form, actually, all the constants, they are explicit. So I think it's nice with this, is you can really see how it depends on the eigenvalue of your opera, of your uh, pre-matrix, post-matrix, on the delta, uh, and on kappa, and kappa is the uh, smoothness of your kernel. I didn't say this, but kappa controls how smooth are uh, your kernel function. So everything is explicit. I don't want to go into the detail, but, but, uh, but it's a nice feature. Um, I think I started a bit like this. Okay, you have five minutes. Or... Uh, okay, so that's basically what I say. So you get this uh, local PL and you get local global convergence. Sorry. Uh, one thing that you might uh, wonder is uh, okay, I already said it, but since we are using uh, infinite depth uh, networks, we need to conserve the, the orientation. So we cannot reverse the orientation. So, yes, so basically, the loss would be, have to be super small to never have to reverse the orientation and still be able to. To compute the global minimizer. So, is there a way to automatically, uh, it's a bit cheating, I agree, but can you always ensure that the loss is small? And the answer is uh, it's like a trick, but once you know it, it's, it's obvious. But you can always be close to interpolation just by lifting your problem to high dimensionality. It's what everybody does in all the theory paper. Sometimes they don't really explain why, but, but, but of course, you can always make a local theorem global by just putting your theorem in high dimension. And in high dimension, I mean, like it's, it's nice and simple. So we did the same. So I don't think it's super valuable in practice, but you can compute everything. Uh, so how do you live to high dimensional state just by a linear operator? And the simplest linear operator ever is just to take your data and you copy several times. Enough times so that you are in high dimension. Then you use your normal OD and then you project back. The same as, okay, you want to reverse orientation, but you cannot. Then you go to a higher dimension of space. Then you can reverse orientation and then you can project. Somehow it makes sense that with this cheat code, you can make the loss uh, as small as possible. And uh, you can do the proof. And in fact, if you look in the proof, the fact that it works is because in the bound, uh, there is a square here. So this really like that. In this uh, local PL condition, it is very nice. It's not, I mean, I, I think Belkin and Al, they, they found a very nice, uh, very nice way to express the property of the theory. And really the fact that it's not homogeneous is what happens, I mean, it's what makes everything work. If you go to a higher dimension, then this inequality is always satisfied. You can even compute by hand how many dimensions do you need and so on, depending on your kernel and everything. I don't know if it's sharp. Maybe uh, here it's like n to the power four. Maybe you can do a little less. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not aware of any uh, minimax or I, mean, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how to call this type of result, but I will show that this is like optimal in terms of the dimension you need. But it looks like uh, the proof is pretty straightforward. So maybe it's actually uh, optimal. Um, another thing that I want to mention, because you might say all my theory is with infinite network and so on, but of course once you have done the, the proof in infinite dimension, it's, be, it's very easy to come back to finite dimension. But what is hard is to start with a finite dimensional proof and then go to infinite dimension. But when you have a nice proof in infinite dimension, you just do sampling or discretization and then you're back to finite dimension. Okay, so I think it's a nice way to do the proof, is you first do the proof in infinite dimension and then you just replace your RKHS by uh, empirical RKHS, you just sample everything and, and, it, and it works. So, for instance, if you do a uh, Gaussian kernel, then uh, every, I mean, in, in kernel you know how to do, you just do sketching of your kernel and then you're back to just uh, finite dimension gravity. So, we just apply classical technique with sketching. They didn't add exactly the bond we needed, but if you I mean, extend a bit the classical proof, uh, like in Resch and so whatever, like papers on, on sketching, uh, you can show that uh, basically the number of neurons you need. need it's quadratic in the number of points, which is a bit of a value, but I think you cannot really do it. And, uh, and linear, uh, what did I say? No, it's number of points. And what is P, by the way? I forgot what is P. Oh, P is the lifting dimension. So P is n, n to the power of 4. So here it's like n to the power of 6. Whatever. So uh, once again, I'm not sure it's optimal, but it's pretty this type of thing that you need. You need something that is much higher than the number of points for this work, but that's fine. Okay, just to conclude, uh, what are the open problems? Because I think there's much more open problems than solved problems. Of course, the big open problem is to prove this for any neural networks where you train everything, and it's totally open. I think there is two strategies that you could use, but this seems very, very non-trivial. If you train the inner weight, what happens is the RKHS will change in depth. Uh, so if uh, you're training, sorry. So during training, uh, your RKHS will change. So can you show that it doesn't change too much? I, I don't know, maybe it's possible. Another thing is to like forget about RKHS and do directly uh, a theorem that would be 
on this type of, of like function. And for instance, in some regime, you can show that this corresponds to like a banner space. So I'm not an expert, but maybe it's possible to do learning with random descent in a banner space. I don't know. But this looks like two possibilities, but they are very, very difficult. Uh, the big open problem is to show this globally, to show that if you initialize anywhere, except like a set of major zero, you still converge, to, uh, you still converge. This is totally open, even in the linear case, even I think with three, three layers, uh, it's open. I think with two layers, it's probably simple to do the proof. With three layers, I think it's totally open, even in the linear, so no, no non-linearity. Uh, so she's a back proof it with two layers, basically, even non-linear. And the last thing is to prove this for other architecture, and super cool architecture is transformer, that uh, we hear a lot nowadays. And transformers are very interesting, because instead of being an ODE, ODE, when you have a single input, you have a single output, with transformer, all the input, they, they bring, they're forced together to evolve. Uh, it's not local mean, as was explained by Jean. Uh, but this makes things very interesting, because now you cannot just have a point that evolves alone, alone. All the points, so if you take an image, it's all the patch of the image, they move together. And instead of doing an ODE, what it corresponds, it's what was explained in the previous talk, it corresponds to Vassar chain flows. So the big question is like uh, optimal control of Vassar chain flows. And it looks super interesting, but it looks super hard. Okay, so I hope you guys will work on this and solve all these problems. And thank you very much. Thanks so much. So, any question? I still have a stupid question. So, to go back to the trajectory slide. Um, uh, this one, for instance? Yeah, yeah so you had to T and 2T and 4T. And yep. So, yeah, yeah. Like in terms of like transformation from input to output, yes. like it looks like why do we need to, you know, have the fine? You know, I think it's great. I mean, it's a good question, but I think it's related to the implicit. So it's not answering my talk, of course, because I'm not answering why this architecture are good. But I think it's, it's, it's encoded in the type of, of uh, implicit bias that you have, that you want to, to have like smooth deformation and you want to quantify a smooth deformation. Okay, and, and the models that are here are models of diffeomorphism. And if you do a L2 flow on diffeomorphism, what you model is like the smoothness of the global deformation, mm -hmm. uh, which is a way to encode like what does it mean for a deformation to be smooth. And it's something that you can compute in a tractable way. Uh, I think in uh, in uh, well, any, anyway, there's maybe other way to encode smoothness. But here is something that is simple to encode. I mean, simple. Of course, if you put many depths, it starts to be complicated. But it's something that you can encode. You can compute numerically with backpropagation because I didn't say this, but everything is like trainable. Whether if you have another type of of, of, of prior, it doesn't seem too obvious. So I don't have a, a, an answer, and I think nobody really has. Uh, just well, observing after, after training, once you identify the uh, input values and output values, then we don't really care what's happening no, inside. The, yeah, that, that's, that, that's totally true. But the question is like generalization for I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, how can you show that this with not so many samples in high dimension, you can still so you need some, some regularization happening. Mm -hmm. If you just say, okay, I take uh, like a deep net that takes this and outputs this. And you do just gradient descent. Since there are many uh, transformations that, that achieve zero loss, mm -hmm. you can ensure that this one is closer to reality than the other one. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why, but it seems that deformation models like this one, the implicit bias that you have, that nobody can compute. I mean, when I say it, I mean, there's no theory about the implicit bias of this type of model, seems to be in line with uh, what nature has provided us in terms of data set uh, when you take a picture of this room. Mm -hmm. So, no, I think it's, it's, it's uh, and, uh, and also what you should also keep in mind is here. I'm just speaking about a single, uh, uh, a single uh, cell, but, but but there is also some rule that is played by the red part that I didn't discuss. So it's not like you cannot just speak about this alone. You for also speak about. It. Yeah. Uh, so suppose you have like so many blue layers, mm -hmm. and okay, you train the model and you obtain some input of output of transformation. But can you somehow distillate? This way, it um, make it shallower after knowing the final mapping. I guess yes. I guess yes. I guess. I mean, I'm not an expert, but at least mathematically, I think there's many ways to represent deformation with few parameters. Uh, I don't know if it's in line with what people do to do distillation of, on, on RedNet, and I'm not an expert on distillation. Uh, but for sure, in practice, people people are able to distillate this type of networks. So for sure, it's true. Can you find a mathematical model? 
that will be compatible with what I say that will distillate what I say, like, I don't know, you compress the in one way, but it's some other way, and still would be close to what people do. So I suspect, uh, yes, because in fact, people can do it. I'm not aware of any theory that can uh, take, like, this train for an holiday and distillate. Yeah, thank you very much for the very nice talk. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, oui. The next question. So he's saying that uh, so what, what you, you refer to the results of the convergence of your thing to the to the zero of the entire economies. It's in the end what you care about is your And uh, can you say anything? And uh, can know. anybody say anything? Has anybody come up with anything about that? To the best of my knowledge, not on such a complicated uh, architecture, and it's related to the. To the question about what is somehow the implicit bias, and then can you leverage this? For instance, uh, I think if, if you take this model, like the random model, I think it's crazy and you cannot prove anything because the set of like random paths is so huge that if you want to generalize with this, uh, it's going to be crazy. But up here, you get much smoother trajectory. So maybe if you make like a theoretical hypothesis, which I don't know if it's true, but the ground trust in the, the, the full data is modeled also by a smooth deformation, maybe it makes sense that it works and you get the good implicit bias. Uh, but the problem is, uh, right, it's the same as alpha. But to answer your question, this is not what we did. We really we focus just on optimization, yeah, which yeah, to be yeah. fair is not true machine learning and it's not true statistics. It's more like a mathematical exercise of optimization. But since people optimize, it's good to know that you can optimize. Do you use the square laws? Whereas in practice, like people use the classification? So, okay, what? Uh, the the laws okay. you use. Yeah. But you people you do ask us for classification tasks? Yeah, so in, in, in fact, you can use any loss, but it does satisfy some pair condition. Okay. So the pair condition of the loss would be transfer on the output. So I assume if things are bounded, you can use also a logistic classification loss. It's true. <laughs> I agree with all that. I don't know why people use uh, logistic. You should just use this square and it works. Okay. Uh, but anyway, I, I think uh, mathematically speaking, uh, since uh, log is a bit weird, it's, it's more difficult. So people like more difficult questions. But I tend to agree with Jean that I don't know why people are this way. The Phoenix square is everywhere. I mean, I don't know. Do you guys see any difference when you switch to square loss? No? I don't know. No? <laughs> I don't do this week, but not that I know. Yeah, I know that you know. I've asked Francis many times. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, I, I agree with this. But, but, to, uh, but yeah, you can use any loss as soon as you satisfy some uh, pair condition, it will be transferred. Uh, so then you cannot use the log loss. Not, I, I assume it, yeah, not the log loss. Unless you have maybe some, some boundedness uh, properties. Which we didn't put here, so I don't know. Okay, so it's a good time to close this session. So I'll speak again. Okay, thank you for your introduction. Um, my name is Chibin. I'm working in Recon AIP, and uh, our office is just inside. So today I'm going to talk about efficient machine learning with tensor networks. And in my talk, I would like to maybe overview some of a bunch of uh, works in my team in the past few years. So I, um, so maybe maybe we don't uh, go to very details, but if you found some interesting work, we can discuss offline. Okay, now, as we know that machine learning, especially the large models and the foundation model or large language model, we need a lot of big data. And uh, also the, the machine deep neural network models has a lot of parameters. And it also takes a lot of computation demanding. So in particular, like GPT-3, and it's using a lot of training data set. And now I think GPT-4 or chat GPT even more. And the parameters, there are 175 billion parameters. It's over parameterization technique makes a deep neural network work, work well. And also computation, it takes a lot of GPU and GPU years and it costs a lot of money. So in our research, we, we study from the uh, several perspectives, from the data perspective, because in some applications, we don't have a lot of training data, like a special uh, application in signal processing or in, in some image processing. Uh, we have some data, maybe not uh, a lot of training data, like some, sometimes data is incomplete or limited. 
like a recommender system, we only observe one data set with a special structure and then many data points are missing. So our goal is to how to capture the data structure from limited data and then uh, make a model to make prediction on the missing point. Or the satellite image, sometimes uh, some area is covered by cloud, but we don't have a lot of training data on the same scenario. All the graph data are about the relationship between the entities. We only have a few relations, but we want to capture the whole data structure and make prediction on the missing relations. Oh, another one is about, uh, uh, about the robustness for adversary attack. It's some kind of noises, but it's noise is very special. It's not follow specific distribution like Gaussian distribution. From the model perspective, uh, as we know, the uh, deep neural network has over parameterization technique. So the number of parameters uh, grows exponentially, but uh, they, they achieve the best performance without overfitting. However, such large number of parameters also generate a lot of problems like training. You take a long time for training and even for the inference, if we do some application online, to make fast uh, prediction is, uh, is a problem. And the uh, uh, deep neural network is uh, a lot of layers, so we can not easily to interpret the model. So we don't understand how it uh, make prediction and how the features extracted from the original data space. And the robustness to adversary attack, so the smaller uh, perturbations in the input will generate a completely totally wrong output. So our question is how to dramatically increase the model capacity. So that means we want to have the similar uh, model capacity, but we don't want uh, uh, to increase the model size uh, significantly. Okay, let's start from the data perspective. Uh, let me introduce some works about the uh, data uh, with limited data and uh, the many uh, application in signal processing or image processing can be formulated as uh, such task. The task is learning from a limited tensor. So the tensor means the data has some kind of multi-dimensional structure. Uh, from the limited data point, and we try to predict the unobserved entries. So to handle such tasks, there are several challenges. So how to improve the data efficiency, that means we try to use as small as uh, possible the number of entries to capture the model structure. And second is our algorithm one need to be scalable and efficient. And finally, we also want to have a theoretical guarantee for exactly recovery. So the tensor completion is a, a very popular method to uh, solve this problem. And basically the optimization uh, uh, Optimization um, objective is uh, falling. So there are two terms. First one is fitting error. That means we try to uh, capture the data, uh, make the um, fitting error or approximation error on the observed point minimal. And the second term is regular, regularizer, which is give us uh, some kind of structure assumption. This uh, regularizer is more most important to make this problem is uh, becomes uh, have a solution because otherwise this problem is imposed. So there are some some standard approach is like we can assume the low rank structure because the low rank means your data has some specific uh, patterns like uh, uh, so low dimensional space. However, when the data is a tensor. So it's difficult to um, make defi uh, definition of low rankness. So for matrix, we know that nuclear norm is, is a up bound of rank function, but for tensors, there's no clear definition of a uh, nuclear norm. And another approach is uh, we assume that uh, data can be decomposed uh, according to specific uh, tensor decomposition. So here we, we, we formulate it as a tensor network because it's a more generalization of ten, a tensor decomposition. And the, and the last one is according to your particular applications, you can incorporate more assumption like smoothness or set information or non-negativity. So in computer vision, uh, 
uh, one of the typical uh, uh, task is to do the denoising. And this work, we, uh, uh, we show that if the, our image is large, actually the image is not itself low rank. So one idea is we can first to make dimension reduction to find the, some basic uh, basis of the image. Then we find many patches, similar patches a group with them. Uh, we assume such group of patches has a low rank structure. So ba based on this assumption, we use a low rank tensor approximation to remove the noises. And finally, we can construct the high quality image. So due to such a trick in computer vision, we formulate this in a general framework like so our, our goal is not to minimize the uh, low rank of data, but we try to assume the data after transformation is low rank. So we put Q here, uh, uh, the, like our data after tra linear transformation, it could be low rank structure. And the rest part is the fitting error. So based on this framework, we can also give some error bound and theoretical guarantee. So I will skip the details. And for the tensor, one special case of a linear transformation, like previous slides, is uh, using Fourier transform. So that means our data is not a low rank or original data space, but low rank on the frequency domain. So this TSVD is a, um, uh, is a typical method to using such an um, idea. But on, under the TSVD, the we, we further define the two different definitions of nuclear norm. One is the overlapped uh, nuclear norm, which is a, uh, uh, some kind of a summation of a low rank along each mode. And, the, uh, and the each one is, is uh, under the TSVD nuclear norm. So we assume that each mode is low rank under the frequency domain. Then we, we do the summation. To minimize this overlapped nuclear norm, we can encourage data has uh, a low rank structure along all the mode. Uh, another one is the latent uh, nuclear norm. So this is, is change to summation to the minimization. So it, uh, this nuclear norm allows the data has a low rank structure maybe on particular mode, but not on the all mode. So finally, we see that from the uh, error bound, this uh, gives us a smaller error bound. Uh, furthermore, if our data may be not very multidimensional, you know the tensor is very good to model the multidimensional, even the high order uh, data. But in reality, like image or video only three order or four order data. So one concept is how about we, we uh, tensorize the data from the low um, multidimensional to high dimensional or high order case. So after tensorization, the, the tensor will become the very high order, like 10 order or even more. Then we can use tensor network, which is a, a more powerful tools to model the data, uh, more, com more low rank structures compared to matrix case. Then we, we can finally reconstruct the, the data. We see that by using such trick, we can even reduce the data, uh, improve the data efficiency. So finally, we have the uh, general framework, like still this is a fitting error, but this part, we first assume the data after tensorization and satisfy a tensor network representation. Then we impose the low ranks uh, minimization on the latent cores instead of uh, uh, nuclear norm on the data space. So by using this framework, so we can further uh, reduce the computation efficiency and uh, for optimization. Okay, finally, maybe tensor network is not familiar uh, for, for many people. Let me briefly introduce tensor network. It's a very simple extension from matrix factorization to tensor factorization, which, uh, which you mostly handle for three order tensor. Then when your tensor is like uh, very high in order, even 10 or 20, so the tensor network concept appears, which is a very um, natural extension of tensor. Due to the n is very large, so we have many different kind of uh, decomposition as compared to three order tensors. So we can have a such kind of network. So each core corresponding to each mode. So the all cores connected 
And the connection means the contraction operation between tensors. So then uh, there are already some uh, structure like tensor uh, tree structure or some PEPIs. And such tensor network concept already widely studied in quantum physics. So now our goal is to try to use such powerful tools to solve uh, in the machine learning problem uh, or machine learning field. So if you are interested, you can look at these two books we published in 2016. And one example yeah, I would like to explain is tensor ring decomposition. It's uh, just one special um, structure which has a ring uh, loop structure. So given an uh, n-order tensor x, we can decompose this high order tensor as many small core tensors. And the all core tensors are connected uh, circularly according to specific order. The connection is uh, some kind of contraction operation. And how to understand this tensor ring? So if given uh, one element in X, uh, each element has an index. So according to uh, the each index, we can find uh, one slice from each core tensors. Then we, uh, we, we can extract many matrix from all core tensors. Then we do the product of all uh, these matrices. And finally, we use a trace operation to make it become a loop. So this is how tensor ring to represent the data. So the data may be uh, captured by such structure if your data is high dimensional. Uh, next, I will switch to supervised learning. Previously, we talked about uh, using data make prediction for missing point. Uh, now we, we talk about if the uh, for supervised learning, uh, we have training data X and Y, and the, but the input data X has a lot of missing missing pixel or missing point. So uh, our objective to still training uh, classifier F height and which is uh, exactly the same as the classifier F uh, 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 that is trained on the complete data. However, the intuitive way is we can do first using tensor completion to complete data. Then we, after completion, we train a classifier. But such sequential approach doesn't work because like as we shown in the figure, if the given this image, when you do the completion, there is no any information we should complete as three or eight. So there is an un uh, uncertainty. So to, to, to solve this problem, we propose us in a uh, uh, one-step uh, training procedure to combine the completion part and the classification part. To, we formulate a loss function, like first part, uh, term is for completion and second is for classification. Since the completion part, we also need to consider the label information, which, which means we can use label information to guide our uh, completion. So such a uh, framework give us uh, uh, better results. And also uh, we give the sufficient condition which can guarantee the classifier is uh, exactly same as original uh, classifier if the uh, such condition satisfied. So, if the if you have a tensor data and it's a time series and you may uh, uh, you may have uh, some time point are missing and uh, uh, if you want to model a uh, 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 create a model to make prediction for the future time series, so basically it's a, it's a, uh, we can intuitively use RNN or temper a temper time series model to do the such task. But they are because there are many time points are missing. The data is missing. Also, uh, of course, we can use neural ODE to to try to model the different uh, deriv derivatives using neural network. But when your data has, has a good structure or tensor structure, so one uh, <coughs> one drawback is you need a lot of parameters, and second, you cannot use data structure. So. Then we we propose a model which called a tensor neural neural ODE. So um, our goal is to um, first capture using the tensor structure efficiently, and the second we want to our model has less parameters, like uh, w w uh, like original parameters we need is i to power uh, power n. Then we do reduce it to the linearly to n. 
and each layer we use the intensive contraction operation instead of uh, uh, traditional neural network. Okay, uh, another one is about the data when your data is noisy. So here we specifically uh, consider the noise is the perturbation. The perturbation is a specific learned to try to attack your model. So what, uh, one work previous work is like, uh, uh, like we can use our tensor completion method. So each time we randomly throw away uh, many pixels and we try to reconstruct the image. This uh, assumption is underlying assumption is the perturbation is uh, has no low rank structure, but our image has a low rank structure. And by using the highly uh, randomly uh, missing, the perturbation is easily destroyed, but our image global structure can be still uh, preserved. So by using this, actually, we can put a purification part before classification. So then we can keep the uh, original uh, neural network model have high performance without uh, sacrifice the uh, accuracy to improve the robustness. Also, such idea can be applied to graph neural network. And uh, we create mining graph, and we assume the low rank structure to using the information between our graph. Uh, by using this, we can uh, remove the perturbation. OK, so next I will talk about from uh, model model perspective. Uh, one typical uh, task or popular work is using tensor for deep neural, neural network is model compression. So we assume our model is already well trained, but we uh, the number of parameters is too too many. How to uh, make uh, number of parameters reduce, but we keep the comparable accuracy with original model. So the idea is quite. Um, Simple. So we assume our uh, parameters W uh, satisfied some structure. Uh, that means there are a lot of redundant information in W, and we 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 will use tensor network to represent W. So if W is has good structure, low rank structure or low rank tensor network structure, we can tensorize W as a high order tensor. Then we represent. Uh, a you see, so the number of parameters the MN to reduce to um, this root of MN. For tensor network, you have a very high, uh, uh, high R, then the compression rate is will be low. So if W represented by tensor network, we also uh, to tensorize our H. H is a uh, uh, previous layer output. Uh, we tensorize H as uh, also a ten high order tensor or tensor network then the operate all the operation in the neural network can be performed by using tensor network uh, operation which is quite efficient so like this we just make connection between the corresponding cores so uh, such computation will be more efficient if the h is tensor network structure to understand why uh, this idea works, we use a very simple model like linear model to, un to analyze. So we assume this is a, a linear factor analysis. So why is the data? And we assume uh, projected to W to get a latent factor eta. So after marginalize eta, we will get uh, a distribution of Y with Gaussian distribution and the covariance matrix. This is a very stand standard. Now let's assume the Y, if we tensorize Y to high order tensor, then everything becomes changed to the covariance V becomes a high order covariance. So then we assume the covariance V, uh, tensor V uh, can be decomposed as a tensor network. So then we have a many core tensors. So that means if we uh, tensorize Y, or if we use the tensor network to model the W, that means uh, yeah, implicitly you uh, give an assumption that Y is a, a high order tensor structure. However, our input data in reality is not uh, image or video, it's not high order tensor. So uh, this paper proposed uh, idea is, such idea is borrowed from the quantum system 
So they try to create a tensor network from the input data. So they, uh, they project each pixel to a two-dimensional vector, like using cosine and sine. And the, such uh, cosine sine means a uh, probability of like probability uh, this bit becomes zero or one. It's a quantum quantum state. And then they uh, use tensor product to make all uh, like pixels created as a, a high order tensor network structure. This is a rank one tensor. So the dimension from the original D become two to power D. Then they make this and as an input, then using tensor network for parameters W, then they achieve the 99% on MNIST using only one layer. Uh, to go further, we think the tensor product is a very good tool to uh, enhance the model expressiveness. So we further propose a tensor polynomial uh, pooling. So the concept is to, we can concatenate uh, the latent representation Z1, Z2. Z1, Z2 maybe uh, come from the different mod modality, like multimodal learning. One is the speech, one is text. Then we concatenate the, all the representation Z1, Z2. Then after that, we use the tensor product uh, of F with itself for P times. So the formula is like this. So we also create a tensor network, which is a rank one. So by, start, uh, by using such, it's, uh, we can further enhance the model, uh, the information on the input. And after that, of course, our dimension will grow, uh, grow uh, expo uh, explode. So we must compress our parameters to make model uh, tra trainable. So the W is also assumed the tensor network and then we can make prediction. So, the, so using the tensor network for W, so uh, one, one point is the number of parameters can be dramatically reduced from the uh, uh, exponentially to linear scales. And the second, from the computational efficiency perspective, and this is very efficient computed because we actually, we don't need to compute this uh, uh, explicitly. And we only need to compute each core tensor G1 with uh, F, the contraction. Then we keep the tensor network structure from the uh, beginning to the end. So such idea uh, also can be applied to other models. This is one example to apply to RNN. And we see that we can change the RNN layers to the tensor network layers. We, we, uh, we, we call this tensor power recurrent models. And interestingly, so we show that theoretically, if we use such a tensor, uh, tensor power uh, layer, so there's a P, P means how many order, how many times we do the tensor product, which theoretically show that if P is larger, it will generate long memory. So that, uh, that means that we uh, that overcome one, one of the typical um, drawback of a traditional uh, and if P is small, it will generate a short memory. So next, because there are many tensor networks, when we do using tensor network to model the parameters, how to choose which one is better for our task at hand. So now uh, people are usually just ma uh, manually tune or choosing. So our idea is to how to learn this tensor network structure from the data at hand. So. Uh, in the past study, um, many study uh, like learn the tensor rank or the tensor uh, tensor structure. So all of them are considered as a model selection problem, but they they ignore uh, 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 important part is about uh, permutation, which is a uh, uniquely exist problem in the tensor network. So we finally we try to solve all this tensor network structure search, like how to learn the rank and the permutation and the topology simultaneously. Uh, and this is our ongoing work and we submitted to SML under review. Um, another work is to understand the CNN uh, because the CN, we try to understand CNN from the, 
um, some kind of perspective. So we try to formulate CN from the deep layers to just one layer. And we see that actually we can write CN as uh, just one layer, but uh, this layer has a lot of, uh, has many subnet and each subnet is high order convolution neural network. So finally we get this. So here we, um, it's a high order, uh, n order um, convolution and uh, there's a core, uh, kernel tensor H, so for each uh, high order convolution. So we see that actually they are equivalent because uh, this kind of VC network also uh, vulnerable to the uh, perturbation. Because when we learn a perturbation for CNN, such perturbation can also attack the VC exactly. Uh, based on the VC representation or network, we can easily do derive the perturbation like upper bound like how the perturbation change our output, the upper bounded by uh, this formula. So this, we see that this upper bounded by the perturbations L1 norm and L2 norm with a uh, exponential n. So if the n is large, that means we have a high order convolution or the deep layers, uh, uh, the perturbation will change output more, more dramatically. So in the few, last few minutes, I will review some late, uh, latest work about the computation efficiency. So just uh, two important work uh, published in last year uh, by DeepMind researchers. They use a tensor decomposition to solve a mathematical problem. Uh, it's a very basic linear algebra problem, how to compute the matrix multiplication. So they try to formulate this problem as a tensor so the tensor is the operation how to compute the matrix multiplication. Then after tensor decomposition, the decomposition result corresponding to a fast algorithm. So this, this, uh, they acclaim this, they solve the 50 years unsolved problem. But when, but after a few weeks, the mathematician show that their result is not optimal a mathematician can even get faster algorithm than uh, this algorithm. So I think such work still need to further. And uh, in the end, uh, I think uh, also very popular or promising uh, the physics, but the uh, very imp uh, important drawback of quantum uh, computing is error. Uh, is, uh, there are a lot of error and error correction problem is the most important. And the quantum circuit are usually is very close, similar to tensor network. So we are uh, considering if we can make some contribution in the future for this field. So this, this is uh, all my talk. And finally, I would like to thank all my collaborators and my team members for their great contribution. Uh, thank you. Okay. So I have a question. So, so for example, how, 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 how is the performance uh, of the tensor model compared to deep learning model? Uh, yeah, in general. Yeah, yeah, for, uh, yeah in, gen in deep learning, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm. In deep learning, actually, the tensor network usually reduce number of parameters. And the goal is to keep the comparable performance. Okay. So on the standard ba uh, database, like MNIST or CIFA, they can achieve similar performance. Okay. But I think uh, the performance always lower than neural network. They cannot get higher uh, or yeah. better performance because they. Uh, yeah. uh, I think this is a trade off. Okay. So mm. efficiency and yeah, okay, okay. you say the efficiency. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but you lose the performance. Yes, yeah. yes. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, <clears throat> one question: When you were um, showing the use of tensors or uh, having reverse model for GNN or mm -hmm. graphs neural network. Ah. Um, do, do you have like, so in, in the graph that you are using, do you have features on the edges or on the vertices? And how is the network, uh, how is the tensor constructed from the graph? Oh, okay. I, I, maybe you talk about this slide. Yes. Uh, Actually, this slide we use tensor to the goal is to remove perturbation. Mm -hmm. we, we we didn't uh, change the graph neural network structure. So, so you assume that 
mm. the network is attacked yeah. and you want to remove the to, to, to smooth somehow the 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 breath that is used after. Yeah, exactly. Actually, we we before the um, graph okay. neural network, we create a tensor, mm -hmm. and this tensor is has many graph, and we, like this uh, so figure shows. Whole, so the whole net, so the tensor mm -hmm. is the concatenation of many graphs that yeah. you observe. Yeah, I see. And by assuming the low rank structure, we 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 can remove the perturbation. Have you mm -hmm. have you worked on the dynamic graphs? With the tensors? Uh, no, we, we haven't. Because yeah. the, um, mm. so the, there are many domains that are using uh, mm. like time evolving graphs and they model it in different ways, but I've never seen people using tensor for that. Okay. And it seems to be quite relevant. It's, it could be very sparse. Mm. But um, yeah, I was wondering if, if you use that since we're mentioning graph that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, I know some paper using tensor for graph neural network. They okay. try to formulate as uh, as we do in the standard neural network to formulate the graph neural network as a tensorized. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, maybe later we mm. we we can discuss about this. Hmm. Thanks. Hmm. Yeah, so you can, uh, any other question? Yeah, so uh, let's Thanks. speak again. It's glad to come here. I'm so lucky that today the weather is not so good, so I won't feel guilty for stopping you from seeing the sakura blooming in such a wonderful day. But you will enjoy it tomorrow. Tomorrow it will be a very sunny day. So basically, I'm in the I'm doing the I, I today I want to discuss um about how to address practical challenge in the artificial intelligence from the medical domain to general tasks. So but first of all, let me briefly introduce myself. So I think that my background was quite different from from everyone of you. I, my background was actually liberal education. So I was I have even at that time I have even taken the training of the therapist, but I have never used it except to help my PhD colleagues to relieve their stress and don't commit suicide. So first of all, I published my first paper on clinical psychology, like thanks to the support of uh, Rikian, which I will discuss later. Then from 2010 and 2013, I was in Australian National University. So basically, I spent like the things I background was liberal education. So actually, I spent a lot of time with the Croft School of Public Policies. So like now, my friends, uh, a lot of my friends are now working UN, WTO, and different like the weird country com organizations. Totally have no relation with us, but they keeps on asking me one question. From the MDGS, I think you maybe you didn't know that this is like the, the things 10 years ago. And then now the SDGS. Like what AI could really contribute to our human well-being? So this is the question I keep on also asking myself. And I hope that today in today's talk, I can give some like answer. So then I went to A star for the postdoc and then NII and Kyoto University to work participating in an impact project, which is a net work by the cabinet office to work on the hardware as well as software. And now we're lucky, I mean, the Rikian as a research scientist and also a special researcher at University of Tokyo. So basically, there are, I'm doing three on three directions. One is on the medical research, for example, like that we have a textbook on the AI in clinic medicine, and then like all sorts of the medicines, medical things. Uh, another one is I now have uh, participating in the Moonshot project. Uh, this project is a very national project, which hopes that can help the human beings to be free from limitation of body, brain, space, and time by 2050. It's a long time. So basically, we are, what we are doing is like to design AI techniques to de de developing the robots, like for the brain, the heart, and the eye. And the third one is the one I personally, personally like most. Like I'm thanks to the support of Rikian, I have I'm now in charge of a joint grant between Rikian and like the Chinese uh, hospital on schizophrenia subtyping. So this cost about one million US dollars. So we try to do the super early diagnosis and subtyping of the different kinds of schizophrenia. And this is exactly the reason why I finally can use my license as a therapist. So, right, thanks to like the support I got like in last year, we have 
quite a lot of papers, like 17 papers, and IEEE, AI, ECCV, and also on nature methods and pattern recognition, IEEE, ETL, and else. So my research team, so there are many things, but my research team is only one thing. So the word artificial is introduced in English from artificial ears in 15th century. It means made by man, contrived by human skill. There are so much efforts on how to make artificial intelligence, including this workshop. So, so many people have proposed so many ideas like the designing this architecture, designing their algorithm to solve this kind of problem setting. But the most important thing is, how can we make the AI for human in the real world? So I think, so for me, I think the real bottleneck to stopping from uh, uh, the real application of AI is like this. It can be summarized in this play here. So all happy families are alike. So existing computer vision and machine learning algorithm perform well on the ideas, conditions, and parameters. But each unhappy family is unhappy in its own way, which means in real way, in real way practical like scenarios, the parameter is will deviate from the uh, pre assumed uh, assumption and then will not be as good as be deviate from the idea. And that's why it is hard to apply the AI for the real world scenario. So this is the key is to identify the gap between ideal and real. This is just like the title of our book to be released in June. I like it most is like say, it's a practical guide for the healthcare profession professionals and all the people. So let me first start. So what is uh, this uh, practical guidance and what is uh, like the bottleneck? Let me start from the uh, medical domain. So the med for medical domain, the gap, there is a gap between engineering and professional and medical experts. For our engineering people, we think that the world is well-defined, simple, elegant, it's abstract, it's beautiful. But for the medical, it's different. It's imperfect and full of uncertainty. And the likelihood of malign is over 10% and less than 50%. So this is the most well studied. I mean, the most of cases, you even didn't know this number. And the most, or like for example, when we are doing the radiotherapy, like for example, as you can see here. So basically, this red part it means that the tumor we are for sure. But you couldn't only do the radiotherapy on this part because the tumor may also like infiltrate in other parts. So you have to make a margin in the radiotherapy. So how much margin should you take? It may surprise you. Actually, in medical domain, there's no conclusion, and we don't know. So it depends on like the how to say it's quite random to make this market. But of course, doctor won't tell you because it will. It's so terrifying. So and then what we can do is like the doctor. Okay, well, randomly, somehow randomly, or with some guess and with their expertise, like the make a margin, and then tell you, okay, let's do it, and then we'll pray for the best. So this is like the real. This is a real world of the like the of the medical things. The actual result can only be seen after years. So here is a major gap. I want to say, AI professional keeps on asking for a ground truth label. Say, okay, well, this is I. So these things we can see. This is a dog. This is a cat. So in the medical, you should give us a label. But actually, doctor can never give this label because doctor didn't know what will happen. They can just give a label based on their guess. And then they will say, okay, well, since you keep on asking, I tell you, there is a label and then you should fit it. So this is like the major difference between the, this is the major gap between the AI, the, to apply AI from, on the medical domain. The label, this label are sometimes meaningless and sometimes uncertain. It's uncertain. So, for example, like how can we define like the, so I think that the, so in order to like the make the like the AI for the real application, it's important to, to answer the following question. How can we define this uncertainty in machine learning? For example, in the report, then it always keeps on saying their right upper of the is most likely through it. Or there is a probability after this this is written by doctor. But if you see the label, like the chest X-ray, I think you, you somewhat maybe you're familiar with the chest X-ray, you never see this. Most likely, probably, because they just directly gave you a label and say, okay, you have to fit it. So how can we model this uncertainty in this, like even the questionable in the machine learning? And 
How can we reflect this description in the causal relation? For example, if you say uh, because we have the low lung volume, so I think that this is called it is right cause it is relevant to the cardio the large heart and then it may reflect the apoptosis or something like that. So how can we reflect this causal relation in the report which has been written already written in the report? So I think I hope that we can have more collaboration on these two topics. So basically for these answers, our mission is like the way our solution is to try to deepen mutual understanding between two fields and participate in a real diagonal loop. So for example, our like the, some previous work is on the, to explain how deep learning works from clinic expect. So basically the technique is simple. We just use again, the things. but the interesting thing is like that. We fool, we tr we're trying to evaluate our result by fooling the doctors. So we make the double blind test, which is on the license that also the doctors, which they like. But what do, what do, we, do we do is like we generate the images, but then we generate image with manipulate the, some like the number of lasers and then mix it with the real like the image and ask the doctor to make the diagnosis on those things without telling them which one is a real image and which one is not a real image. And they find they actually can make the diagnosis on the, like the perfectly as we expected on our things. So another solution is like we use a human gaze as external free, sorry, as external like label to help to enhance the things. Because our human has an ability to like the, do for the selective attention mechanism to help us our cognitive system to focus on only task relevant visual clues. So for this case, we propose some like this new novel method. Like for example, we use a real human face to support the attention mechanism. I use this attention mechanism to support the like the new deep neural neural network. And it works quite well. So for this one, we have for this end, we even developed our own gaze tracking hardware platform, which is more accurate and more efficient and much cheaper than the existing one. And I think that I would recommend you to check this paper we published in EasyCV. We collect the world's biggest human gaze data set. So for this human gaze data, for this human gaze set, we even try to see that when people doing different recognition tasks, for example, from other family genesis, the people actually seeing in different like the places. We find and then like the, we use this data set into the like the our uh, in a fine like the fine how to say the uh, fine recognition task, and we find that it significantly improves the performance, and we may, we get the sort of performance for this very challenging task. And we have also doing some like the for the surgery and the things to find the real support, the real diagnosis system. So another gap I want to mention is the gap in vision. So for example, we know that the computer vision works, most of the computer vision things work perfectly on the ideal things, like the image is well lit and then the image is so normal size. But how would you deal with the low light condition? or it's overexposed. This is quite common. For example, like the, for the video surveillance system, you could expect someone just don't make any criminals at night. Or like when you're driving, say, okay, well, it's the sunset, so the sun, now it's the sunset time, so I should, I couldn't, I, I should not, I should go home because my automatic car couldn't do it at night. Or about the haze, or about the raining. So how would you, how can, the another gap is to how to deal with the practical solution to have to provide practical vision solution for this un, un, long idea situation. So one of our solution is to, we develop a new type of the camera, which is based on terahertz imaging, but this is just ongoing. So this is like the most straightforward solution is to percept, propose a perceptual constant representation. So how shall we do that? Well, basically, what do we do this one is to Basically, we do it in this way. So I think that most of you must be familiar with the uh, so with the auto encoding. So what is auto encoding? Like for example, whenever we have image, then we encode it into the architecture, and when we try to decode it, this is the auto encoding we're familiar with. So this is auto encoding. Some people, a very clever guy, proposed a theoretical foundation called auto uh, auto encoding transformation. So which is me? Let's say. If I directly encode the image and decode the image, 
So basically, the encoder and decoder need to focus on like the very details of the data. So which means that actually, but for most of the details, maybe it's not relevant to our current task. So he had proposed, why don't we directly encoding the transformation? So what does it say? I have two images. I have one image, and I assume I transform into another one. Then during the encoding, we is encoded on a manifold. He said, if we can just decode from the two features and not to see the original data, but to see their transformation, which means that to know how this image is transformed to this time. If well, I just get the features of two and then know how the transform, what is the transformation inside? He said this manifold encoded in these features should be invariant to all the transformations. It should be robust to all the transformations. This is a very cool, like the theoretical foundation, but it works very well, well. Which means, for example, if during the training, we do the training like we have image here, and then we put it in the dark image, it's a transformation, or in the ring image. Then, if I can just find it's like the transformation here, it means that this manifold, this encoded manifold, is actually robust to the emulation change. So it means that, for example, though I'm training the normal image, but if it is dark, because then in this manifold preserving encoding, if you encode it on an invariant space, and then it can, we can easily recognize with the standard method because it's in this manifold, they're in, in, invariant, it's the same. So this is a very cool idea. So based on this one, what we are doing is like the to do it in this way. Like for example, we have, we have a normal image, then we make some transformation to transform into the real dark images. Then we encode into that, we use the standard object detection architecture, no matter CL or transformer. And because all the, the architecture can be divided into encoder and decoder. So in this encoder part, then we say, okay, well, you have to tell us like the, what is the transformation? What is the transformation from this one to this one? So for example, how fast it is, how many noise in, in, the, in that, and this one, one feature. And we find that whenever the it can find, observe that, it can decode it. It means that our manifold, this encoding, encoder itself is regularized by a manifold, which manifold is invariant to all the, like, the change in the darkness and lightness and things. Then, it, with, with this like, small trick, we in, in those, uh, like CNN and Transformer to have the ability to recognize the object in the very dark conditions. But of course, we also made some like the degree, some manifold regulation to make sure it will not, it will because to make some orthogonal tangent regularity to make sure it's because it's a multitask thing. So we make sure the manifold will not collapse into one point, but to properly span it. So it's a very simple idea, but then it worked well. Then another, uh, apart from this AET, then like we have another contribution, it's like we consider the real world. So here I want to clarify a very important thing, but maybe ignored by most of people. The photo does not directly reflect the physical world. Whenever we have a physical world, it's by the photons, and then like the whenever it's collected, actually it has to go to the photon flux, electron voltage. So you have to go to the DSP condensation and a lot of like the process to finally generate the final image, which is in a JPEG format. The JPEG format itself is also compressed. So which means that the photo itself is, has a quite high distance to the real physical world. But for most of the time, because we take the image in the, like, the proper lighting and the, all the conditions, so it is quite similar to our human eye, which means like it is quite close to like the physical world. So people just take it for granted. But actually, it's not. So in order, especially when you're dealing with the real world challenge, the, like the challenging condition, you have to take it into account. So another contribution of our paper is like we consider a practical physics model that like consider this DSP and uh, DP, DSP and the things. Like for example, where have we have an image? We at first like the, to change the what we have the input image, the big set. We if like to do the on DSP to re cover them from the like SR W like the WY balancing to, to original raw data, which is a real photon like the input in a CCD. And then do the process and finally make them into the real ISP.
So this is like takeaway message I want to take you. So based on this uh, understanding of ISP, we have also made the enhance the real world. We also do some simple one like. With the dark image, we directly enhance it into the dark, into the like the, the bright one. So basically, I th I like this. This is like technically it doesn't have too much contribution, but we give a very good engineering implementation with only 90k parameters of the transformer. Can you imagine that a transformer with only 90k parameters, and we make it in 0 0.004 second processing speed and the SOTA performance. So the uh, the takeaway message. Yes, like though if you're you're if you are dealing with a dark image, try to download our code. The code is like that over there. Try to use our code and then download it and try it on your method because it's still so fast. And then later laying light and apply our transformer always light. And maybe you can also also borrow our transformer technology architecture because it's so efficient. You can also work on other like the like the other like the changing the other like the things like the GAN, the GAN task to like the transform image from one to another. Okay, so here is another gap in the computer vision. I think you may be quite familiar with. For example, whenever an image is not, it's a small. So it means the resolution is low. It will keep much semantic meaning and semantic structure. But the contrary, the cost is like that. We couldn't recognize the small things. On the contrary, if the resolution is sufficiently high, then we recognize all the tininess, but we will lose in the we will lose our semantical like concept, which means that we couldn't find the big things. So how to solve them? This is actually a well-known problem in computer vision. Standard method is like people just build like several heads like they all use a pyramid way to like several pyramids to deal with some folks on the small resolution, some folks on the large resolution. Or some people just do, do use a super resolution to change the smaller image to the smaller resolution one to the higher resolution one. But there is some problem. For example, you didn't know which is the like the super first of all, super resolution costs much resources. In addition, like you didn't know which is optimal upsampling way. So you don't know the what is the best resolution. So here we also use our perceptual constant percept like the representation to propose the, a still self-supervised learning to do it. I think you can just think things like the, what we discussed the last time, just, the, just the discussed. We, we use the autoencoding transformation. It also works here. Like we have an original image here. And then it will transform them into the small different resolutions with different downsampling array, noise, and degradation kernel. So, and then we can project that in the encoder, it just project on the manifold. But if we can recover the transformation parameter from the, these things, it means that this manifold will also be scale invariant. Which means that, for example, if you just have an image, like if we just do it in this way, then you don't need to worry about the scale problem. The, it's the, in, the manifold itself is like scale invariant. And here, like that, we propose like that. What we do is like we only use the super resolution as a self wise single as here. We try to decode it into original super resolution. You to decode it into original size. So which means to let the manifold be regularized and then get this manifold. The advantage is it works on the mainstream signal and transform transformation transformer architecture with just do the minimal modification during training. And in the inferior stage, you don't need to do anything. But it will significantly enhance its like robustness over different size of image. Yeah, so basically we also name it as AIS in thanks to the in, for the final fantasy. Okay, so we have also do some things like considering like this unique problem in Japan because we have Fukushima radiation, so we consider how to like the in a three D sensor it will be. Uh, it will be like a dropped by the radiation. So how can we deal with uh, like the radio radiation and get the clean image? Then here is another gap between the real application. Like most of our technology uh, depends on expensive GPU cards and reliable power supply. It's not a problem for us in Tokyo or in France or in like the Germany. But it's very difficult to implement on the ro robot. Or in the resource poor countries like in like the Central Africa or Luanda, in the Luanda, they don't have these things. 
So what we are doing, we, what we have, that's what, what we have to do is like, we have designed our own FPGA, which is like the on-chip SRAM, which has is much faster, which like let's say energy efficient, and also very like energy efficient, the AI, especially AI chip, which is energy efficient, which can be used for the robot and also for like the resource pool countries. So our solution achieves roughly 10 times of processing efficient gains. I think this is also very, this is also very important <coughs> to consider how to this is like the key to let the AI to real work for the real world scenario. And finally, I want to say the gap is a gap between the heart. So, like the, in Europe, we have the trustworthy artificial intelligence AI artificial intelligence guideline, which means that the AI should be transparency and keep the privacy and data governance, and also make sure it's diversity, non discrimination, and fairness. So this is also important. This is what we have always considered in during the research. So, like in our like recent progress in on the triple. AI, on the triple AI, like that, we just propose a very simple idea, use a diffuse model. So what we do, very simple, we just change the human face, use a diffusing model, diffuse model, to change to another people's face. So we can automatically protect their privacy. So if no one really needs that image, then we can just uh, like uh, decode it with some key to recover the original image. And it also indulge as an another advantage. Because we change the face to another people's face, so we keep the fairness. There is no discrimination against the Caucasian or the or other people. So because all the faces have been changed. So it's a very simple idea, but it works quite well and get well praised in the Tutorial. So I think the medical message is like the, we have so so many techniques already, the deploy views model again. But important thing is how do you, you really use it to support our human being to make the deep fake for good? Okay. So thank you for listening. All the codes are available online. Yeah. Welcome the collaboration. Thank you. Question, please. Yeah, so I have questions. So yeah. for example, I see your some application in the breast cancer or something. Yes. So like you use like you use AI to uh, close the gap of the uncertainty of from the doctor. Yes. But the AI for example detecting the breast cancer also also has its own uncertainty. Yes. So how can you overcome that uncertainty? Yes, so this is, a, I think this is an open question, for mm -hmm. example, in the breads. Uh, actually, for example, mm -hmm. in the uh, in the breads, like we only know, like in the breads four, we only know 40% or 50% is a malignancy. Mm -hmm. So currently I don't have, couldn't say for this case, I don't have a, like the, what we are doing is like, we directly analyze the EHR data. So we can know directly know like the patient like 30 years later who, who are killed or not. Okay. And we try to do the subtyping okay. to not like the to not only use this like breast four label. We think this is a coarse label. Okay. We just try to make some fine labels. For mm -hmm. example, to know like some people just uh, get survive for three years, some people survive four years, and then to see like whether their like the tumor structure has some change or if there are any change in their gene okay. to try to do the subtyping. So basically, this is kind of our solution. Okay, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for your presentation, Can you Go to the last slide. I'm not sure I got the idea of what you were doing. So you you change the face uh, on the image yes. using some deep fake. Uh, yeah, deep, actually diffuse model. Diffusion model. Diffusion model. Um, how do you know you're not replacing it with another face from the data set? Oh, so basically we have some like the celebrities uh, face. Those face are like the, we are training on the diffusion model is trained on the celebrity <coughs> face. So, and what they want is more, like the one, when you just use the diffuse model on it, it will become totally different people's face. Uh, that's not, well, mm. we're not sure. I mean, there's stuff called a membership attack Yeah. where you know, if you have like the website, this person does not exist. Actually, you can show that you can like retrieve some people's well, or some images that are close from up to the image uh, of the that were used for training the model. Yeah. So actually, you could be using an image here to replace the face of someone, but yeah. could be using the face of someone else. In the data set that we use as the diffusion model. 
Yeah. So, so you, you mean that even change to the, the people new the, the the new place may also have privacy issue. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the, the privacy you just um, move the privacy problem from the people on the picture to the people on the data sets. Yeah, I think this is you're you're raising a very good question. Then this is a problem of the diffusion model it's privacy. I think it, it's worse than like the discovery. Yeah, but for current one, which at least we protect the current place, we solve one problem in, in each time. Yeah, and I guess if it's a celebrity faces, well, the the privacy is not so well. I mean, well, yeah, but it's still a problem. But the if you're if you going to sell uh, something that has a medical diagnosis and yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, 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 that's true. That's true. That's true. Yeah. yeah, but I think you're raising a good question. It means that diffusion model itself again also have the privacy issue. This is means that this field really uh, needs more like exploration. What's also the problem is that some of the diffusion model have been trained on some data that have been scrapped from the internet. Yeah. And I think it raises some legal issues as yes. well. So I think that we have so many experts in the diffusion model. So maybe we can like consider like that. How should we find a solution for this problem? Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure I understood the thing about the radiation thing, like right? okay. the image of radiation. Yes. So it's a actually it's a, like the 3D uh, radiation. So because we have a re as considered we have a 3D data uh, 3D sensor like lidar, so it's actually highly affected by the radiation. How is it highly affected by? Radiation? So basically, like the uh, it has different like models. For example, sometimes like this is like the one the most simple like things. It just add a lot of uh, pepper salt noise here. So we just show the pepper salt noise here, but they also have other things. For example, the sensor will just break, or like sensor will just think it's much deeper or like the closer. So we just show the most simple case here, but actually the actual thing. Do you have yeah, empirical, a real empirical? Uh, not yet. Thank you. Start the question, please. Yeah. So let's start speaking. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.